Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of The Min Mac Show, a place about games, friends, and getting better. My name is Ben Hansen, and I'm glad you're here today. I'm joined by Janet Garcia. Hello. The energy is just electric. I'm joined by Kyle Hillier. To later afternoon podcast. Hell yeah. Kyle's here, too. Yeah, I'm here. What's up? And bringing it right back up, Leo Vader's here. What's happening, gamers? I'll tell you what's happening to this gamer. Uh, We got a lot to cover in this episode. We got such a great show for you guys today. Take it away, Leo. Sorry. Can I say that? Yeah, yeah. What do you want to talk about today? Uh, We're talking the new Xbox, all the new Xbox reveals coming to Xbox. (laughs) Right, right, right. We're talking foam stars. We decided Skull and Bones is not worth talking about. <laughs> did, so how much did you play of, of, of Skull and Bones, to be fair, Leo? I mean, just over an hour, I got to a part where I just keep getting, I keep leaving the starting island, and a level 10 player just kept killing me over and over again, just one-tapping me with a flamethrower. Okay. And so I gave up. I, but this is this is the start of the arc. It, it, a month from now, you're going to be coming back begging us, like, please, can we talk about Skull and Bones? It's the future. It's the future. I know myself well enough to not say that won't happen. Okay, there we go. Um, also, Leo, just want to remind you, we're going to be talking about, yeah, Helldivers 2, Hell Skate, um, Hell Persona 3 Reload. No, this is the big episode where we're unpacking Persona 3 Reload because we have this crew, but then by God, we're going to be uh, clapping some folks out of here just to pack as much gaming content as possible in here. So we're also going to be joined by Charles Hart, video editor uh, for MinMax here, who's helping out here and there, and then associate editor at Game Informer. He's going to be joining us because he wants to talk about Persona 3 and Mario vs. Donkey Kong and more. And then we're joined by our dear old friend uh, Elise Favis. Uh, to talk about where she's at now in a post, um, she was just uh, caught in a wave of layoffs, which is uh, sad to see, but she's great, and so we're going to be talking to her about all these good things, and then Kelsey Lewin's joining us uh, for uh, the back third, two-thirds of this podcast. There's a lot to get to here, but before we get to all of that stuff, I want to do a quick plug. Um, If you would like to directly support MinMax, directly support independent games media, even at that $2 tier, and you own an Xbox and would like an Xbox code, boy, do I have an offer for you. Uh, If you jump in before Monday, jump in before this Monday, the 19th, you support MinMax on Patreon at any tier, even that $2 tier, we will send you an Xbox indie game through the Patreon DM system. I'll send you a little message. It will actually be me saying, hey, how's it going? How'd you find us? What kind of stuff do you want in the future? And would you like an Xbox code? But we have hundreds of Xbox indie games to give away. So jump in there, support us before Monday, and I'll message you and send you an Xbox code. And as always, I thank thee for supporting MinMax as an outlet. And also, if you jump in at that even $2 tier, you get access to the Discord, which is the Shangri-La of the internet. Um, And then also you can contribute to the deepest dive on Final Fantasy VII Rebirth and a ton more stuff. So thanks, everybody, for that type of direct support. Which Will you be our Valentine, fair listener? Please tell us ask you. that. Um, also, I should point out that we are doing the deepest dive on Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. We're creating the best, most thorough discussion about that game on the internet. It's going to be in the bonus podcast feed for Patreon supporters and then up on MinMax's YouTube channel as well. Now, the game comes out, as we all know, uh, at the end of February. But for the first time ever, we have a unique opportunity here where it's, it kind of kills uh, two birds with one cool stone, which is what we want to do here, which is we can start this deepest dive before the game comes out because there is that free demo on PS5 for chapter one. So the first episode of the deepest dive on Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is going to be... Uh, we're going to be collecting your comments for it on February 25th, and it's going to be covering everything in Chapter 1, which is kind of Cloud's Past, is the beginning of that game. And then, you know, you can buy the game if you want and keep going with the deepest dive. But it's kind of exciting, because I don't think we've ever had a completely free opportunity for the first episode of a deepest dive. So you can jump in on PS5, play that demo, submit a comment over there on Patreon on the 25th of February, and then we'll read it during our discussion as we kick off this huge five-part discussion about Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Will there be enough to talk about for five parts? Who can say? I haven't played the game yet, so I'll say yes. Um, but hey, uh, we should talk about Xbox. Um, the internet has been... How would you quantify it or explain how the internet has been reacting about Xbox stuff, Janet, over like the last week? Is it full? Uh, the kitchen's on fire. We're running around in circles. The last week? Yeah, the yeah. rumors of Xbox going completely third party with everything has been... That's what the rumor was. Like, that's what the rumor grew to. At first, it was like, oh, I hear like, you know... Um, Gosh, what is it? Hi-Fi Rush, you know, mm. might be coming to other things. And people are like, I hear the entire kitchen sink. 
is going to be on the Nintendo Switch. <laughs> you know, is they're they're putting it on your iPhone that like they put that U2 album that one time <laughs> and gaming as we know it yes, is yes. going to collapse in on itself because games are too hard to make, everyone's laid off, everyone's quitting and I'm scared and I'm loud. Yes. That's what the vibe has been from you know, people on the internet that I think have harsh you know, reactions. I feel like peers were just kind of like, we'll see. We'll wait and <laughs> you know? see, wait and see. Yeah, they renamed Twitter, but maybe they should have just renamed it to I'm Scared and I'm Loud. Like, that should have just been the name of the platform. I think that's right. Yeah, because it was people running up and down streets with flags that said, it's the end of the Xbox hardware. All your purchases were for naught. The end is nigh. Um, so the point is, there's a lot of speculation, a lot of confusion. Phil Spencer got out there and said, hey, we're going to have a business update next week. Um, and then, lo and behold, they drop the Xbox, the official Xbox podcast with this business update, which I feel like... Look, this is part of the bigger picture. There's a lot to unpack here. I do feel like Xbox over the last 10 years have been really incredible at messaging. I think Phil Spencer is the best communicator in the games industry from an executive position that I've ever seen. And I feel like pitching this as this is a business update on the future of Xbox. It's going to be on the Xbox podcast here it is. I was still surprised by people in the chat being like, where are the announcements? This is this is just people talking. Right? I feel like they pitched it in the driest sense to try and set yeah. expectations just so they can didn't try and we, squash all you, rumors. Didn't you call the stream the future of Xbox reveal? <laughs> <laughs> Leo, I didn't know Who's what was going to be happening, to be <laughs> fair. Uh, I had no idea of that expectation. I can go back in and tweak that thumbnail if I need to. But you're right. That is part of the problem. We try to be reasonable at MinMax, but even us, it's like, well, how do you frame this? Like, I guess this is them talking about the future of Xbox. Like, I, I mean, I think it still is the future of Xbox. It's just the future is anything that isn't today. So it's not necessarily like the next 20 years, but just like what is coming up from Xbox. I think maybe people maybe had the expectation of a... Of something that creates more of like a shift in the space than this did, but also yes. we're kind of getting ahead of it. So we are. What actually was mm. even said in this? Yeah, we should we should break it down. So a lot of speculation about is Xbox going full third party? Is yeah, Halo Infinite going to be showing up on PS5? A lot of fun, uh, wacky rumors like that. The big picture is uh, Matt Booty and Sarah Bond and Phil Spencer from the Microsoft team talking to Tina Amini, formerly of IGN, now uh, working on Xbox as well. Um, they all got on there on the podcast and they said, "Hey, everybody." It's four games. It's four games. There's going to be four games. We're not going to announce what they are. Because- and then they said, what are the four games? And they're like, we're going to change the subject. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, so, so basically, yes, they said four games that are Xbox games are going to be coming to other platforms. We're not, not Starfield, not Indiana Jones. Very yeah. important. Not Starfield, not Indiana Jones. Saying that's not, those aren't part of the four games, but not ruling out officially that it would those would ever come to another console. Um, it's just fun executive wording here if you want to really get legalese about it, which I think is the language Haley speaks. Um, but, and then largely saying our strategy is not changing in a significant way moving forward. However, Sorry. look, we need this to have... Xbox needs to stay healthy in the way it stays healthy as we get more users and players playing these games. So the future of exclusives are going to be growing smaller and smaller. Um, but we all know that that's the truth anyway. And so there's a lot of interesting video game industry stuff to unpack in this. But the big picture is them trying to put out the fire by saying it's just four games. But if you zoom out from them saying the four games, big picture wise, it's like, okay, we know we know which way these wins are clearly uh, shifting here. And it's going to be Microsoft pushing more and more of their stuff onto other consoles. And I've, I've always liked Phil Spencer and I've always liked his point of view, stated philosophy of the future of this industry shouldn't be keeping things from each other. Like right. that's just not a good way to go about it. And I find it disappointing that for the expectations for announcements for like what we want Xbox to be in the future, which is to at least have like its own thing and to lean in more into the things we like about it for it to have been four games that we won't tell you what they are. And they're not our main ones is like, so disappointing to me. It's like the most baby announcement when I wanted them to go more full throated, more endorsing this philosophy they've always had. Yeah. It's still like, it is a big decision. So I understand why you have to take baby steps with it. But like, if you want to get people excited about Xbox, you got to do exciting stuff. I think what's going on here and I don't know, but obviously there's been a lot of rumors about when the next Nintendo direct or showcase is happening. My money would be 
that they don't want to step on Nintendo's toes and Nintendo's going to have a developer showcase where they announce that Hi-Fi Rush is coming to the Switch. And it's like, well, we can't step on that. So then we keep one mysterious and have the other three out there. I think it's just cleaner to be like, you know what? Let's just get out there and set the big picture for the future of where Microsoft is going and leave it ambiguous for what these four games could be. Like, uh, what did you say, Ben, at the beginning that you like that he's like the best communicator? I think so. Right? I, I think he's like the too much communicator like i don't what did we gain from this like what why didn't if there was the leak and that was clearly like we need to put something out yeah it's like you guys could have just let that sit for a while and then had a big fun announcement in like a month or two or whenever you're planning i don't think it's time for a fun announcement information is like i mean borderline irrelevant it's not irrelevant if you're really underwhelmed by all this it was a lot of corporate speak and like they're like, you know, we make every decision for the long-term health of the Xbox, which is why we had to lay off 2,000 people. But like, like, let's move on from that. And, you know, like, I don't know. I just, I was just, didn't, it didn't do anything for me. Well, I was not like, good on you, Xbox. You really shared some important things with me. <laughs> they needed to plug the holes in uh, this sinking PR ship. I mean, over the Ooh. last week to have all these giant xbox fans out there being like oh there's there's no more hardware moving into the future this is the end of xbox abandoned ship do everything just to have them come out there and just but say I mean, like hey like, i don't know it's i just the same course I as think always it's like you just let it sit like they're i think they that's a wrong, wrong in the future what are they gonna not buy a game because if, if there's like they think- if the entire internet screaming at these people and screaming at overall company the xbox but, is dead the xbox is dead and they're silent for four months are you nuts they're, that's, that's but terrible to strategy. me i totally agree with what you're saying but we're getting to the conclusion of so then you make a tweet about it not then you make a 20 minute podcast round think, table what's wrong with going in more in depth and trying to talk through their philosophy i think uh, you i think don't, do, do I don't stupid... feel like there was depth to be gone in on yeah i, I think, think they were always gonna from, put yeah. this out and the old, that's the vibe i got and obviously they're gonna sell it the way they want us to see it like i have no way of knowing what the truth is because my, my philosophy in in life is you can only really trust if something's the truth if you trust that they would tell you if it was the opposite just in, in general, like, would you tell me if it was otherwise, like, personal, yeah. business, anything? And yeah. if the answer is no, you got to kind of take it with a grain of salt. So that, you know, um, I guess disclaimer out the gate, like, kind of yeah. taking it based on what Phil Spencer and the Xbox team is saying. But based on their conversation on this is, hey, this was always going to be a podcast. I think in another world without the leaks, this would have just been one of those podcasts where, oh, hey, uh, The Verge and you know other places wrote up this article saying that Xbox is planning to do X, Y, and Z, and we'd maybe have it as a small talking point in all these podcasts. I think because of the leaks, and even in the structure that, like, because Phil kind of was, uh, I think, uh, I don't know if Phil was the first, I think he was the first one to speak on, like, it was kind of panel format for the podcast, where mm-hmm. Kina was the kind of host, like the moderator of the conversation, and they kind of just talked about, like, wherever the points were. But Phil came out the gate, like, hey, this was going to really be about the Activision Blizzard stuff, right. like all of that. We're putting the exclusive stuff at the front so that y'all don't got to scrub through the thing even though we timestamped it. Like, I feel like this is part of that. And I think, you know, we can debate, like, is it better to be, like, more close to the chest? But I think Xbox's general brand and decision is they, they're they like, you know, good guy Xbox. Like, that's their brand. Yeah. Whether yep. you believe it or not, that's up to you. Yep. But, like, that's their whole thing. Oh, we like really love communicate. We have these panels. We have these like long streams of like Forza, like, you know, like Horizon. And then we also, we care about you playing everywhere as long as we are also financially prospering. And yeah. that is, you know, that's ultimately what it's about. And, and like, and I admit cynicism, right? Like, I am being very cynical, <laughs> yeah. but I think it's just because of just how much that was like, we made a promise to let you play anywhere. And, you know, we're delivering on that promise. And it's like, guys, I don't care i <laughs> like, I, I haven't care this, anywhere. look i'm not saying this was a, a spicy podcast uh, out there from xbox but maybe it's just no i no, believe no. in the formatting of podcasts i like having yeah. giving them sure. the room to like have you know a pretty stiff executive conversation but at least a remotely <laughs> human conversation about like you here's would rather have at, here's some the strategy s- like conversation about it is what you're getting yeah just right? a series right. of rather tweets i feel like it'd be such a, a blah and i think there is yeah you say they're not conveying that much but i do think like it's fascinating to hear the heads of you know xbox here talk about you know matt booty had a whole spiel about just yeah it's not so much about platforms anymore it's about games you know, and he specifically cites it's Fortnite and Roblox, and they're so much bigger than any platforms out there that the platform is less and less relevant, and therefore the games are king. And to do justice to these games, 
at times they need to grow their community to keep these things alive. And therefore, that means we need to expand beyond the Xbox. And so the four games, this is speculation, but it seems like, you know, they say they say they're over a year old. They kind of hit their max. There's stuff we want to do more with it's in like the future. It's like 20 questions. It really <laughs> was, yeah. And two of them are kind of like community supported games and so that feels like the community ones are probably sea of thieves and grounded janet i don't know if you had other thoughts on that yeah. but that seems like the easy one-two punch right. i mean the verge had a story that they they it's a report you know yeah. grain of salt but they had you know sources close to microsoft are pointing to grounded and sea of thieves and then and they they listed two other potential ones as like well. hi-fi russian pentiment seemed like yeah. the options for, as well yeah for me one of the more interesting tidbits from this you know kind of jumping around to different different spots of what they talked about, but was the the comment about like what those two smaller games were, which the direct quote is they're two they are smaller games that were never really meant to be built as platform exclusives and all the fanfare that goes around that. But games our team really wanted to build. Yep. Which to me says like and I, you know, Hi Fi Rush, I had tweeted this out. I'm like, not I get it. It's not like a system seller. It's not moving the you know, it's not that big triple a like glossy thing that i think a lot of the more standard player you know looks to when they're deciding what console to purchase but to me that speaks to when they think about the clout of their portfolio high fry rush or whatever the game is because we don't know yet it doesn't move the needle to them and i think yeah. that speaks to what they see is like what they want is xbox tentpole exclusives which is at the end of the day it's cool that more people can play high fry rush but at the same time i feel like that kind of just builds the additional pressure of like when you think Xbox exclusive, it has to be like 10 out of 10, like greatest game you ever played. And like, I think that's a really, I obviously if you can play the game there, it's still kind of part of the portfolio, but I think it speaks to a very specific look at like, we want you to think of a certain thing when you think of Xbox exclusives. And that yeah. doesn't include some of these more interesting games that people wanted to make. The like, I think that's project. kind of games a Games that bit. were way more successful than we expected them to be. <laughs> yeah, like, I don't know. That was an interesting kind of like, ooh, like if you look into that, like I thought that was, you know, an interesting yeah. tidbit that came out of this. Yeah, so I mean, on the big pillar front, I mean, Jeff Grubb over at Giant Bomb, he's been saying like, I've been hearing uh, Gears of War is going to be coming to other platforms. Mm. You know, and, and him making that. the case of like, well, if Gears 6 is further out than they would like it to be, like, yeah, if you want to keep the legacy of Gears alive, releasing like the original Gears trilogy, even like on Switch or Switch 2, PlayStation, like that would be, I I could see it happening at this point. You know, they say, hey, it's just the four, it's just the four. But I mean, they're saying eh, we're going to be moving more into this in the future. Uh, they're just trying to have their cake and eat it, too, by saying it's just the four, but also open your eyes, sheeple, uh, yeah. because we need to expand. What, these what makes spaces. you say that? That they're going like to the keep vibes. expanding more? I think so. Yeah. I mean, the fact that they say, hey, it's just these four games, but then so much of the messaging was about like, hey, we need to focus on the health of the industry and the health of the Xbox. And for the long-term health of Xbox as an organization, we need to have people playing these games. And when it's fully saturated in our platforms, we need to move beyond. And, you know, Phil Spencer even had that moment of saying, you know, like, hey, it's I've said it before, but that idea of exclusives are just going to be a smaller and smaller part of the industry moving forward. Um, so yeah. did you not get I the guess, sense? By the way, to I, counter my earlier cynicism, like I'm all for, like bring those games to other platforms. Yeah, like, that'd be yeah. great to have Gears on PlayStation and Switch. That'd be awesome. It'd be wild, but yeah. Totally. I, I, I thought it was odd that they use such passive language about that when it's like, we are the good guys who don't want games to be exclusive. And then it's like, in five to 10 years, Games won't be exclusive anymore. Who knows who will be responsible for that? Hopefully somebody has the courage to be the company that does that. <laughs> you know, I wish they made more of a vow in that direction. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Well, it's tough because you're the platform holder, though. It's like, oh, platforms don't matter. Okay, so then why am I investing in your platform? <laughs> it's like, you and know, we also care a lot like... about having the most advanced uh, new console when that comes out. That was part of their talking points. Was, right. like, yeah. The so I, technological leap we've seen. I do think it is kind of a somewhat like both sides of your mouth. So I don't really know what it your is. vision fully is, but I mean, I personally don't actually see this as like, Oh my God, like in three years when Starfield's on my iPhone, we're going to look back on this conversation and knew they didn't tell. Like I personally don't really see it that way because a lot of games have gone multi-platform and these are really specific kinds of games. I do think like, sure you could argue, Oh, well you got to see it before they like show it to you. I personally am going to wait until I see like, 
a more, you know, tentpole title sure. move. If I don't see that, I personally think this is no different than Helldivers launching on PC at the same time as PS5, which mm-hmm. is like, hey, that makes sense. And also, that's kind of like the perfect blend because console and PC, there is overlap, but like, I like console because I like plugging right. in my little box and moving it around to my little TVs and yeah. I have my PC here to do other things. But I think what's so interesting about this and why it's different, I think, than just, you know, Sony releasing stuff on PC is the way that they explain it as well of like, hey, at this point, we've kind of purchased our way. We've purchased so many studios out there, especially with Activision Blizzard. At this point, we are one of the biggest publishers on PlayStation. We're one of the biggest publishers on Switch. We're one of the biggest pl- publishers on mobile. Like they're already out there. And the message is so confusing when you've purchased these companies and promised uh, the good Lord upstairs and your mama that you're not going to make Call of Duty an exclusive uh, in court. You had to <laughs> bend over backwards a thousand ways a Sunday to make that case. Like they are just in such a weird patchwork strategy at the moment of these games are exclusive. These aren't that I kind of agree with Leo. I kind of wish they would have just ripped off the bandaid and been like, Hey, it's game on for everything. But I think if they message that here, I think people would be really down on the overall trajectory of Xbox as a brand. And so they're trying to hang on to that while still pushing that idea of this stuff can go anywhere. But I mean, when, yeah, when Minecraft and call of duty are two biggest franchises and they're already up multi-platform, then at what point do you just say, whatever, let's give these big games a year and then everything's going to be everywhere. And it's for the health of the industry, man. Yeah, they're in a tough spot where appealing to their core fan base is the opposite of appealing to everybody else. And they don't want to alienate either group. Yeah. So I get that. And I don't mind that this was a podcast. Like I had fun watching it with you and I get that it's like (laughs) a part of selling their brand, which is what this was about, is like. I don't know. Showing you people will make you less yes. excited to dump on this thing. I feel like that's just something core about being oh, a human. Yep. And so it, it made sense to have a little more personal of a conversation, even though it was all very scripted. Yeah. If you're into, in the eyes, the one true. shot, you know? Yeah. I mean, this, if you're a dork for this type of corporate messaging, which I'm sad to say I am like this, this is the Super Bowl of corporate messages <laughs> for like the game industry. Like, you know, wow. like, so what, a, much, what a line. It's true. Like so much pressure is on you know what? them. I'm a tab moment. over right now. Biggest news. I'm writing this down. <laughs> it. Super Bowl of uh, corporate messaging. But yeah. I mean, they also, they had a couple God, what uh, a nerdy job this is, right? Ugh. That's why it's fun. <laughs> uh, but they had a couple carrots out there for folks, right? Of being like, hey, you know, trying to make the case for why Xbox is still an important brand is like, hey, Game Pass right here, baby. Backwards compatibility. They're really hitting all the hits of like, uh, cross play, cross save. We got it all. Please come play on Xbox. It's the best place to play all that stuff. Um, but that is part of that. They're saying, hey, all the Activision Blizzard stuff will be coming to Game Pass and Diablo 4 is going to be on there on March 28th, which is like, all right, that's that's a cool thing. And yeah. maybe quietly the biggest uh, tease of the whole thing is they said they had some exciting announcements on the hardware front near the holidays. So if you believe the leaks, that's maybe the all digital yeah, Xbox. Yeah, because that like can we saw? <laughs> yeah, the weird cylinder thing, but then also rumors about a handheld gaming device as well for Microsoft. Switch 2? Oh, that one's oh. ours. Oh my that God. That one's ours. Okay. We don't believe like, in boundaries gonna, anymore. If Microsoft could, if Nintendo could just be like, hey, can you make our hardware? Because we like, we're oh. unwilling to ever make something powerful enough to run what your iPhone can run. And then they put <laughs> Mario on that. Now oh, that's yeah. a podcast to react the to, dream. baby. <laughs> yes. uh, the Super to Bowl podcast. of hardware. Did they, Kyle, did you pick up on this when they said that, hey, we're also planning for the next generation of Xbox and it's going to be the biggest leap ever for a console generation? Would you like yeah, to put any money I on that it. one? I think, I think I'm going to be blown away. <laughs> okay. Wait. All right. Pessimistic <laughs> Kyle is taking away. Sorry, I, I walked over your actual question. What was your No, question? you answered it. It's just there's okay. no universe where that's going to be true, but they'll they'll mention teraflops a lot and we'll all yeah. we'll all be impressed, <laughs> I'm sure, in some way. Yeah, uh, no, I, uh, it, it, I mean, it, it's just the nature of where we are with computing these days. It's just like it's an impossible promise to deliver on, you know? <laughs> Like, unless we can go Super Nintendo N64 again, <laughs> I don't think this is going to happen. But with the power of the cloud, Kyle, who needs an N64? Oh, this is going to be spectacular. Um, fascinating stuff. Let us know what you think in the comments. Uh, please. And maybe stop uh, threatening Xbox executives' lives. <laughs> like, everyone can maybe yeah, don't do that. drink a lemonade at this point and uh, play games where you want to play them. Turn their salary. They should have announced that we all took salary reductions. That, that would have be been nice. nice. I would. Be that nice. would have been like, oh, you guys are the good guys. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, true. I this mean, archival stuff is nice, but like, yeah, if you guys have all taken public salary cuts, 
Well, if I'm you're just, if you're I'm trying to make, I'm just trying to put things out there to make my dreams come true. <laughs> I think what Hanson's trying to say is if you're giving death threats to Xbox, lay off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there we go. Good take. Uh, Hell Divers Two. You guys want to cover this thing? Yeah. Sure. All right. Here we go. Hell Divers, a game that. What a beautiful little success story this is. Like that first game was cool. It definitely had its fans. This game came out. I feel like. Maybe I'm projecting a little bit, but I was definitely in the camp of like, okay, first game was cool. Sony pushing this as like a co-op emphasis multiplayer game. I feel like I have the wheelhouse for where Sony's multiplayer games have landed in the last five years and it's not looking great. But them getting behind Helldivers 2 felt so good in theory and now in practicality because uh, this thing is tearing up the charts. Um, it's their most successful game that they've launched on Steam. It's got over 200,000 concurrent players on Steam. Um, I assume on PlayStation it's kicking ass as well, but it's it's weird, right? Like, this game's cool, but, like, there's been a lot of co-op games over the last five years that everyone says, well, this is cool if you have a group, but who would ever get a group together? But then this one, everyone's like, well, I gotta get a group together. It's, it's happening, the, everybody. The last five weeks. I feel like yes. we have had so <laughs> yeah. many multiplayer games, like, come out. And so many of them have been like, uh, I don't know, I'm not even going to try. And this is, this is like the one where we're like, no, but this one's okay. Like, this one can come on through. <laughs> mm-hmm. There have been so many hit games already this year. I, it's, I stand by that Grandma's truly popped off with the Christmas gifts. I feel like we're still <laughs> reaping the benefits of that. <laughs> the Steam gift cards. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm oh. loving Helldivers too, though. That's surprising, Leo. It, it, do you want to say specifically what got you into Helldivers? Because there's like one thing that you saw that turned you around and apparently turned the world around. Um, it's nothing I saw. It's mere. I, well, yeah, no, it wasn't something I saw. It was exactly something I saw. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um I wrote it off initially because it kind of is an easy game to do that with. It's it's like EDF. It's like Starship Troopers. It's a wave defense bug thing. I'm sure that's fine, but I don't really. I'm not getting out of bed to go play it. I'm still in bed. Right. I. <laughs> I, then I saw the article that was about how when you're in your ship, your destroyer, looking over whatever planet you're on, doing your mission, you can see these beams of light, which are other players calling in their stratagems, which are airstrikes, supply drops, things of that nature, and that they put in the effort to make it so those were actual people calling in actual drops. That's those, so you know, cool. they're color coded. So it's like these are drops that are actually happening. It's It could just be random. A lesser developer would have just had it be random little <laughs> d dips of light that you could see, but it's it's accurate. And that was a really interesting indicator of the way this game is doing online, which I think is really cool. The system seem generated and it's like everybody is working together to take back planets bit by bit. And at the end of every mission, you see, oh, I've made a <laughs> one ten thousandth of a percent of impact towards 100 yeah. percent planetary uh that liberation for democracy <laughs> Learning, i have not touched this game to be clear but that is the thing that made me start the download um was like what oh, a funny everyone... sentence there's so many funny sentences y'all are saying the, <laughs> what, got, what got me to download it yeah that's i mean because so, i was that's like, so real no that's like i'm not jading yeah. you that is such a real feeling I love because that. like i don't yeah. you guys know me i don't really get into multiplayer much but like just that all like everyone is working towards a goal it's like a better version of the metal gear solid 5 thing you right. know and then the other thing, this is this is like really stupid. It's a strange. But I learned that to call in the drops, you actually have to put input like combos. Yeah. 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 For some stuff. reason, I was like, that sounds fun. That right? sounds like you're actually doing like computing or something. Now, so, Kyle, that's what it feels like. And and when it's like stressful, when you're overwhelmed by bugs, you are like having trouble doing it, and you're getting it wrong, and it's it's tense. It adds so much, and it is a small weird decision that this game has a lot of a lot of cool things like that. Where were you last time around, Kyle? Because those features were also in Helldivers One. I didn't. I never touched that game because it's like co-op, right? Like, I mean, all the things that Leo too. didn't get out of bed for. Like that's how I felt about Helldivers One. It's like people seem to like it. Had the same features. Like I'm just. It's not my. And it's like isometric overhead perspective. Sure. Right. Yeah. The original. Yeah. yeah that's just like I'm good. No, isometric. It, it wasn't, is wasn't it, for me. No, it is exciting to see this though, and like that camera shift. And yeah, I guess that's the secret to bring in a new audience. It actually worked here. You know, like. If this was the same isometric camera, I'm curious to see what the success of Helldivers 2 would look like. Um, but it, it's fun to see a series have this big of a shift. I mean, it's not exactly a GTA 2 to GTA 3, but it's cool to like, oh, the game industry can still shake up a series in this way and bring in a new audience. And I'm sure there's some fans of like Returnal that are looking at this like, oh, a Sony game, sci-fi, third person. All right, maybe I'll check this out. 
Um, yeah, um, I, I like though that the, the specific things have gotten me and Kyle into it because it's like it's an indicator that there are things interesting things going on here. It's not like I'm in it because of this one thing. It's yeah. like maybe I'm not giving this enough of credit. And I'm going to say something that'll get five people listening to this podcast to go get it right now. Uh-oh. It's got the Metal Gear Solid Five in addition to the supply drop type stuff. It's got the Metal Gear Solid Five dolphin dive dive to prone Ooh, yeah which is like yeah. the most fun little feature to be in a shooter in a decade and no one's ripped it off until now <laughs> and you dive back to prone and then you're laying there shooting and you know getting your last few shots in with that extra few feet of space it's like a fun tactical move and just flashy and stupid and actiony yeah janet you're playing this thing co-op right you're playing with the remap mm-hmm. crew and stuff how is it uh playing with the group yeah, I played with Remap for a bit. I also played with um, my boyfriend Isaiah um, the same day, just like at night. Um, the days are really long. <laughs> um, yeah, it's like it checks out. It and it's a little too hard alone. I will say because I played it yeah. alone too. So I've played it in every version. I find it too hard alone, and other people that I think are more skilled at shooters seem to also find it kind of too hard alone. So keep that in mind if you're you know trying to figure out how you want to approach this thing. But yeah, it's it's super fun. I think the thing for me that drew me in that I like clocked immediately was just like the personality of this game. Like to yeah. Leo, to your point, like there's so much specificity and also, yes. Oh my God, I said that word right the first time. Shout out to that. <laughs> there's so much specificity <laughs> in the world it's creating and everything is really like thoughtful. I think so many of these games, my beef with them, besides the fact that I'm just not like, you know, super moved by the, details of like how the gun feel is like it kind of all feels the same to me if i'm shooting a gun for the most part because i don't like have that deeper knowledge of that style of game sure so for me it's a lot of like yeah we shoot this thing we're just shooting things all the time and i don't really feel anything more than that and i think hell divers 2 is like you're shooting things one for a reason a stupid reason a very ham-fisted over the top sarcastic the, mi- the missions are called like spread democracy and stuff yeah like, that. like it's very punchy it's very if you like fallout humor if you like even to a degree portal humor it has a lot of that energy very like, starship one of my, troopers yeah in this game this is one of the few games where in the tutorial i had like oh my god moments in the tutorial which in the tutorial is very traditional it's like you're in a little tutorial area it's actually kind of similarly structured to how Splatoon does their tutorials, where it's like, now you do this button, you learn this thing, now you learn this thing. But they had a, a moment where um, they teach you how to heal, which is like up on the D-pad on controller. And they're like, okay, first interact with this like little box. You touch it, it stabs you in the stomach, and then you have to heal. And that was so funny, so unexpected. The injury simulator or something, Battlefield. Injury. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. like, oh, like that's so fun and cool. And it's like... I just love all of that. And, you know, obviously we can get into the the moment to moment, the little stories that happen. Mm-hmm. But I think that's really what got me like, oh, my God, is this game like really good? And it was <laughs> such a nice standout. I think, too, when you play so many games so often, it's easy for things to kind of like blur together, especially if they don't end up like being super great games. Sure. So for this to be like, OK, yes, this is exactly what a good video game feels like. Boom, we're here and we're here like immediately. And it's just such like a, a nice, like immediate connection to like have with a game like that. Yeah, yeah. fantastic, but like genuinely amazing music for mission completes yep. and stuff. It's it really pulls you in that way and makes it exciting. We'll see if that gets like diminishing returns uh, longer yeah. term. But it's like so exciting to finish a mission right now. The yeah. other little thing I want to shout out is the gunplay. It's like these little decisions that are, are my favorite type of game where it's like seems like a game you know but they make decisions ba- that aren't like based on the established way of doing things example being the supply drops example being the way you aim you have these little lines of course for your general direction and then there's a circle that shows where your bullets are actually going so it's not just a random spread you're seeing the circle sway not at all when you're prone or when you have like a broken arm or are sprinting it's swaying a ton and you still know where your shots are going and are trying to compensate for it and it feels a lot more active versus like I'm just shooting just feels worse right now because I broke my arm. Yeah. Yeah. I think too, they like really thread that needle well in making friction without it being like, Oh my God, this is like a highly technical experience. It's one of the most like detailed arcade vibes I've ever had Mm -hmm. in a video game where they have stuff like, you know, besides the thing that you mentioned, Leo with the spray, they have like, you walk through snow and it's like, Oh man, you're really trudging a lot. Like you slow down in spots. You like, can injure certain body parts and that'll like change how you can maneuver 
Um, the friendly fire, I think, works super well. That's a really game, fun then, idea. It just it lends to like so many instant clips of you guys like screwing each other over, dropping a dropship in the wrong spot. All that fun stuff is great. Totally. Yeah, the I'm a big fan of the mines. Like I just laid out, and that's I think it's another thing I really like about it is that it's a shooter that you don't have to like be shooting as often because like I just don't. I mean, I, I like shooting guns in games, but it's not like the end all be all for me mechanically. Yeah. So being able to use like the stratagems, which are like the call down drops and all that, and get to kind of play timer cooldown while also doing gunplay in between. Like, I feel like it adds more variety to what I'm able to do where like, I'm a big fan of that kind of thing in a game. Like I love like turning enemies against each other. I love dropping like yes. mines or little traps. So like being able to drop that and be like, okay, I'm, I dropped like 800 mines. And now it's like, you literally create a minefield for like, not just the enemies, but also your partners. And it's like, and then someone would be like, hey, who dropped all these mines here? And then, you know, people are like falling into it. And then it's there's just the right level of like goofy multiplayer chaos without it being like, OK, this isn't even really like a game that I can get more technical and into like it. It balances both in a way that I haven't really seen done quite so masterfully before. It's really well done. L last important thing I want to say on it yeah. is like it is hard and not as fun to play by yourself. Yeah. But without friends. Quick match matchmaking with random people is something I almost never do in games, but it works awesome here. The communication, you can communicate everything you need to and help each other out. You have good graphics of like, I can give a supply pack to this person here so they have more ammo. Oh, nice. And you can have those kind of fun nonverbal interactions. I haven't had to voice chat whatsoever. It's just like you're playing with bots, except they're real people who have different personalities that you pick up. And it's like, oh, these two must be friends because they're sticking to, with each other the whole time. Yeah. It's totally the most fun way to play by yourself to match make with randoms. Oh, that's sweet. I want to recommend that. Yeah, uh, Arrowhead is the name of the developer. I mean, going back to like Magicka from back in the day, if you remember that game and stuff. And this is one of those instances where it's like, all right, start the countdown clock until Sony buys them. Like this, this level of success for a multiplayer game, which Sony claims they've wanted to get into more and more over the last couple of years. You know, maybe those strategies are strategems or are shifting from a corporate level, but I feel Could the like the live service games be good. Right. I mean, honestly, are they secretly making good live service games? I, I would put money down that within the next five years, this is still going to be the high water mark for like Sony multiplayer live service efforts. I, did, I, the, did Naughty Dog play this? And they're like, you know what? Throw that other thing. We're making away. Like, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. Pack it in. Sorry, Joel. Uh, Hell Divers 2 is named that thing. It's uh, it's 40 bucks if you want to check it out. But uh, I know Jeffum's really enjoyed it too. So I'm sure we'll be talking about it more on the podcast. Uh, in and battle future. passes that never go away. That's a nice Ooh. thing. Nice little olive branch. Yeah, that's sweet. Um, and the only natural transition, of course, is to talk about the next big game. Foam Stars is here, baby. This is like Hell Divers 2 on Smack. <laughs> 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 All right, Foam Stars is out on PS Plus. Uh, if you have that, you, you can play this thing. This is Square Enix's shorthand. Was it Square Enix's Splatoon that uh, folks played at uh, Summer Game Fest last year? And the takeaway was like, wait, Foam Stars isn't that bad. It's actually pretty fun. And now it's out, and Hell Divers is running scared. It's peeing in its pants. Now, Leo, you've been playing <laughs> Foam Stars. What do you actually think about this thing? It is fun, moment to moment. <laughs> okay, it is. It is. It it's is. like Splatoon, except the foam stacks vertically. So you end up and you surf on top of it. So you end up like almost tricking, like jumping from foam to foam. St that stuff feels great. And you foam somebody up by shooting foam at them. Maybe it's soap foam. A couple characters, it's milk foam. You've got Ooh. a latte character who has like a latte super. Excellent. So it's like coffee foam. And you have an ice cream character who has like a cream laser. I believe it's, it's called. <laughs> Does the foam look different though? No, no, it's all just foam. Same <laughs> foam tech. Um, but I think the ways it's different from Splatoon or other shooters are kind of aesthetic. You're, you're foaming characters until they're big balls and it's says chance and now you have a chance to kill them. So you surfboard up to them and hit them and they go <laughs> flying and hit the wall and explode. And that's how you get kills or chills as they're called in this game. Are they really called chills? Very clear that it is not kills. They go out of their way to make <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, I know love that. that. Chill yes, Manjaro. Um, but it's it's all very aesthetic it, it, difference. It it feels good on the haptic triggers to pull that off. Yeah. And it is fun moment to moment like that, but it's not like I need to go play this for an experience I'm not getting anywhere else. Right. Right. You right. Know, with a billion multiplayer games to play, frankly, I'm still I only ever really do one at a time and I'm still all in on the finals. It was like this is I probably will never touch this again. Okay. But uh, it's it's another example of Square making something 
I feel like Square has just been releasing so many games of like, I don't know, this? And this feels like one notch above that normal Square quality of, uh, check this out, everybody. <laughs> Yeah. Also, um, it's also worth noting yeah. the legendary skins in the store. One legendary skin, a couple charms, a sticker, whatever. Forty five dollars for what? a legendary skin? <laughs> no, you must. There's be like twelve skins in the store that are forty five dollars. Good lord. Um, also, and it's not even in like foam gems or anything. It just says forty five dollars <laughs> with a dollar sign. USD. Pay yeah. up, foamy. Um, and also the. the Little gripe is the way you do loadout. You have you have like things you can roll for that are your perks. So you can get mm. different rarities of improving your jump height. You can get an F jump height improvement, S jump height improvement, and you just or you could get a, something that's not jump height improvement at all. Yeah. You just keep rolling. You spend this currency to get a random perk that might not even be a good version of that perk, and that's how you build your loadout, which is just so horrible. Like before every match. No, and you accrue over a long time and then you go into your like customization and you and it's character specific to roll okay. what you have and you have to like get rid of what you might like in the hopes of getting something else. It's the most garbage system in a multiplayer game I can think of. It's crazy. I wonder if that is kind of like in that again, Splatoon vein, because it's like you can scrub, you can like re scrub your like shirts to like get different like <laughs> attributes to them i feel like no one knows what i'm talking about no, <laughs> but I'll pretend. i promise people listening were like yeah you go to that like the guy you know the guy in like the, in the you know the guy the music's unique you know you, I get, remember. Like you spend the, like the urchin money or something right, <laughs> right sounds right. so fake but i wonder if that's like trying to be in that vein of like the randomness to it um can you leo can you speak to what's going on with this like the foam they make it from their bodies what's mm, happening with that you could, pass can you shed it. light on that um, we're getting into Thirst Council territory here, where some of the characters <laughs> seem underage, and I don't want to get into that too much. Yeah, that's smart. But it's all I, foam. I, no gun. comment. Right? They have foam guns. It's not, they're not producing foam from their body. There's right? a you screenshot. The, the, oh. That I what? dropped in the text channel that's, like, from the game story, apparently, and it says, like, I used to really hate my body for making foam. I thought I was a freak, so, like, some of the, they make the foam? So it's like I'm having confused. a squirt gun, but it like is funneling your spit. I don't know. Okay. But Why would anyway, so chat hard? wanted to know about this. And I wondered if you, yeah. as the true foam star of the panel, had any insights into this. I guess it's, weird. Yeah. it's like a Guiji situation, maybe, it where is, it's like, yeah. it's best not to think too much about it, you know? I have follow-up yeah, questions. Yeah, I just, I'm only just feeling lucky that I don't like this game and feel the need to defend it. Looking at this image of this young girl saying, I used to really hate my body for making foam, I... I'm glad I could kind of just se just separate myself completely from it. Now, Leo, I do have a couple of follow-up questions. Um, is it true, like they say in the game, that Foam Smash is about having a blast without bashing anyone else's beliefs? Not in my experience. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> uh, Leo, also, um, is it true that this game takes place in a city called Bath Vegas? Oh uh, sure, I, I missed. Is that, that. real? What yeah, is, yeah, it's called Bath right Vegas. Like, no, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's a that's, that's a where the stretch work of, of all time fun. Is. I think I think you're right. Oh, can you imagine a foam sphere? Oh, if that's somebody's oh, ultimate, that. just There's to really have it the size of the actual sphere. Haba um, haba. Can you copyright a like a giant circle? <laughs> 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 Absolutely. Don't even dream of it. Uh, foam stars, everybody. Hey. Curious what you all think of Foam Stars. It's out. It's out, everybody. We've done it. Um, okay, let's get to the real dirty game, and here we go, everybody. This game is called Hellskate. This is for the cool kids, not your babies not who like foam, foam and, and sucker anywhere. <laughs> yeah, they like bath time for freaking babies. Uh, this is demons skateboarding and attacking people in Hellskate from developer Phantom Coast. Uh, Kyle Loon helped fund this thing. Uh, I've played a little bit. Leo, you've played a little bit, and Kyle, you've played a little bit. Yeah, like yeah. A, an hour or two. It's in early access now. I yeah, think yeah, just yeah, launched early it. access for for Hellskate here. Yeah. Uh, so. Tony Hawk roguelite is the pitch here yeah, with, right. with the selling little, point little, as well. Sprinkling of Hades on top. Yeah. You know? And then the pitch as well, which is smart of them to get out there with and be like, there's a designer who worked on Tony Hawk's underground. Uh, Steve Zwink. He's working on this as well. Uh, he's out pushing over the boundary to make it feel better than the average Tony Hawk wannabe. Um, Leo, as someone who just played through all these Tony Hawk games again, how are you feeling about Hellskate here and how it feels? 
Um, it's a really cool concept. I don't think the feel is totally there. I feel like my takeaway is I'm really excited to see where it goes, but there's been it's the combos and everything has just felt kind of off. Like it hasn't felt yeah. totally reliable 100 percent of the time the way that Tony Hawk does. Like that's such a high bar to to compare it to yeah. to the point where I feel like you don't need to get into it right now because it is early access and you can see where it develops. But also, if you think it's such a cool idea and want to support it, like that's why it's an early access. So. Yeah, I was surprised jumping into it, like how Tony Hockey it, it is. I guess I shouldn't be that surprised by it overall, but it's like, okay, it's like you can actually get off the board here like the later Tony Hawk games, but then also we're going to have you jumping around to collect the different letters to spell out Hellskate. Um, and then like, oh, yeah. to do, you know, like the manual, it's like the same controls as Tony Hawk. You're like, I mean, even, even the tricks are the same. Right, like, right. Flips and nose grinds and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, you, stand, yeah. yeah you'll feel comfortable with it. And it, I thought it felt pretty good. I'm not the wild connoisseur of Tony Hawk that a lot of folks are, and Leo especially having I mean, that it be was, that fresh. That was my reaction, which is like a, a kind of still in line with Leo's. Is like this feels a little smushy. I guess it's like a, it doesn't feel quite right. Like you don't even have to land correctly. You can land yeah in any way, which I think is a design decision rather than an oversight to like help with the combat to be like let you sort of not have to worry about it as much, so you can swing your sword. But it is closer to Tony Hawk than uh, any Tony Hawk like I've played in the recent years. And that was enough to make me kind of be like, OK, I like I'm comfortable already. Yeah. And that's yeah. and that's going a long way. Like the one that I always think of is like Skatebird. I was <laughs> oh, like I was I was like excited for that. And like it really very immediately. I was like, this is how dare not... you say that name to me? We're good. Sorry, I'm sorry. I brought Skate it up. Burn, I was burn a just, nice let's day. just talk about Recore next. You know, it's like, come on, come on, Kyle. I this, think... this, you start skateboarding and you're like, this, this feels close. Like this, yeah. I feel comfortable. I know what I'm doing here. Yep. 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 Agreed. And it is such a fun pitch of randomly generated levels that have those Tony Hawk goals when you enter them. So if you were, if this becomes the most amazing gameplay ever, like having infinite levels of collecting Hellskate and, you know, destroying the four things you're supposed to destroy, classic Tony Hawk level stuff, yeah. like that's a really, it's a really cool pitch. And it is a weird there, idea there to have like... those letters that I was like, this randomization though, no mm. one can get that. that. You can't get that letter. What do you think? <laughs> Has to be gettable. Has to be gettable. But it's fun to, for like yeah. the Tony Hawk, Tony Hawk list of objectives in this game than to have in that mix like kill five enemies because you also have a sword and you can go around it's like oh that, that or, was fun in there or kill an enemy within a 10,000 point combo right right yeah cool, cool ideas for sure and yeah uh, Hellskate curious to see uh, where it goes in early access here but I think it's just on Steam at the moment but uh, congrats mm -hmm. to those folks for shipping it out uh Hey, this has been fun, but we have so much more to cover on this very packed episode of the podcast. The industry is booming, and this podcast is booming as a result of it. Um, Leo, you want to lock arms? We're going through the plane of existence to the other side, baby. But Janet and Kyle, do you want to clap out uh, or plug anything you want to plug before you clap out? I don't think so. I can't. I'm ready to clap. I'm ready to clap. Okay. Bon voyage. <laughs> Charles Hart, welcome to the show. Hello, thanks for having me. Of course, video editor extraordinaire here helping out with things at MinMax, but then also associate editor over at Game Informer, and of course, Kelsey Lewin, welcome to the show. Hi. Official That's cohort. Um, if people are really interested in going behind the scenes and into the weeds at MinMax here, we got rid of that whole differentiation between contributor and cohort because it made no, no, no sense. No, 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 no. Ben promoted me. That's I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's the worst I did fit such I a good have. job. That's right. And I shipped out a badge and said, welcome to the... <laughs> cohortery everybody we're actually gonna get into it in community questions later on in the show there's some good uh cohort insight uh and we're also joined by elise favis hi thanks for having me welcome from uh the game informer days and then elise i know this is like the most basic take and i apologize for it but genuinely i checked out your linkedin just to see like what was her title again at uh, Britannia. And then I, I was reminded of Washington Post again, that you worked at the Washington Post. And still, it filled me with a sense of like, Jesus, that's so impressive that you worked oh, for the Washington you. Post. It was a wild ride, I tell you. Yeah. It was good. It was a fun job. Yeah. And speaking of wild rides, uh, you were the communications director for Pritania Media. I know we don't want to dwell on it too much or get into it in a big way. But they had a, a recent round of layoffs and um, you sadly are looking for a new job at this point. This is true. This is right. Yeah, we... <sighs> So yeah, it's unfortunate. We have Crop Circle Games is pretty much fully furloughed um, with a shaky future if there is one. Mm. Uh, 
And then a lot of people on the corporate side, which is where I was, um, got just fully laid off. So that that's what happened. But yeah, I ran comms for them uh, for about a year. Uh, and that was fun. That was my first time working at, like, you know, with game developers and like working within studios. We have four yeah. studios. We were like 200 people. It was crazy. That's huge. That's um, huge. Well, less than that now. But yeah, it was it was fun. It was great. Everyone was like all our teams are incredible and the stuff we were making was incredible. So super. Do you feel like excited. you want to stay on that side? On the game development um, side? I mean, if I can, yes. Uh, but I'm kind of open to anything that comes my way. Uh, you know, sure. and I, yeah, I, I, I really did like this a lot. So I'm kind of like, you know, thinking community management or more comms or PR. Yeah. Um, otherwise, yeah, if there's like journalism, you know, opportunities, I'm, I'm essentially yeah open to to whatever's possible and hopefully remote so we'll see right and there's a bit of a ticking clock because uh you have a visa and they're going to ship you back to canada within a couple of months (laughs) yeah i've got i've got uh, probably like 50 days now um before you know needing to leave the country and things like that because the visa expires so so short yeah stuff yeah it's like it's last time this happened, you know, when uh, Charles and I were laid off from Fanbyte, I had to go up to Canada for like five months and just like live with my parents and figure that stuff out. Um, yeah. But I'm, I'm hoping that this time around it'll work out better. We'll see. Yeah, for sure. And it's, I mean, it's, it's rough out there. Yeah, it's on your LinkedIn. So I don't think I'm telling tales out of school, but we got lunch not too long ago and talked about it as well. That like the wild part is, you know, Britannia was a startup. It's created by former folks from Undead Labs, like State of Decay. And you might have heard of it if you're in the games press arena. Like that's where Austin Walker, he went to work for one of the studios. And Josh Scher from Naughty Dog is over there as well. There's a lot of talent um, in that cluster of studios and stuff. Um, But what impressed me a lot is like, yeah, director of communications, communications director for all of these different studios, but then also working on finding investors for these (laughs) games as well. Like that is a level of insight in an industry that none of us can compete with. Yeah, I have to say I didn't expect that to be part of the job, um, but I worked really closely with the business team, and that was that was really insightful. And I think I've I learned so much in a short period of time of just like how publishing deals come together, and you know what investors even look for when they're talking to game companies. Uh, this is too simplistic, but more complicated than we think, or less complicated? Is it just hey, the vibes uh, in the room are good, handshake for some of these things, versus like you need to prepare. Uh, a, a lot page longer novel. and a lot more steps than I realized, I guess. Um, okay. A lot of coordination on both sides, you know, um, months and months of work sometimes even just putting pitch decks together. So, yeah. So if you have an opening and you're listening or watching this, uh, at least rules, uh, almost all of us have worked with her at some point. Well, I guess if you count Kelsey working out of the game former office, then all of us have worked with her at some point. Strong <laughs> so vouch over here. Yeah. 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 At least how should people reach out to you uh, if they're interested in, in picking you up? Yeah, I, you know, I'm active on LinkedIn, active on Twitter slash X, whatever people are calling it at this point. Sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's mostly, those are the best ways. Twitter uh, is just my full name, Elise Favis, and uh, same on LinkedIn. Yeah, right on. And you and Charles work together at Fanbyte. I completely forgot about this. That's so wild. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wish Fanbyte had stuck around longer because we were doing a lot of cool stuff there. Yeah. It was a good team. Charles, did you have like a favorite piece you made over there? Um, I wrote a stupid article as were all of my best fan by pieces. Sure. There was like a reveal trailer for Mario Strikers yes, on the I was, Switch. Sorry. <laughs> I was just, I was like, if you're not going to bring that up, I was going to bring it up. Okay, cool. <laughs> and it was just, I was going through all the old images of the Mario Strikers and how far back his foot would come up when he kicked perfect and it it had been getting higher and higher and it was like (laughs) here's a new trailer for mario strikers also dude you don't need to your foot doesn't need to go that high it's it was like a full 180 degree angle (laughs) (laughs) he's tickling his own forehead with his heel because it looks cool for the promo (laughs) shots that's good stuff. Uh, well, hey, uh, you're all assembled here today to uh, finally fulfill the promise uh, for a long time on the podcast now. I feel like it's been at least the last 14 episodes we've been saying, yes, we're going to talk about Persona 3 Reload. Yes, we're going to get to it, all you RPG fans. And then we say, eh, just one more week. We kick it down the road with a, with a big a big kick of our own. And now the time has come. This is finally the time to celebrate everything glorious about Persona 3 Reload and to celebrate Leo 
what we're missing out on by not being fans of Persona 3 Reload. Let's celebrate. Let's celebrate. Um, although, I just learned, I think, during our Crush episode of New Show Plus that you were a Persona 4 guy, which I don't think I really factored in. That's interesting to me. Yeah, I was a high schooler, so I played games about high schoolers, and now I only play games about 30-somethings. <laughs> <laughs> and Sideways is my favorite film. Uh, okay, uh, Kelsey, Elise, Charles, you've all been playing Persona 3 Reload. Um, I started it. It's on Game Pass, which is uh, very cool to have that ready to go. This is the remake of Persona 3 from 2007, I think is when it came to the States. Um, because I was trying to do that math of like, man, JRPGs on the PS2, I was hot and heavy. I should have been picking up everyone. I don't know how I dodged the Persona series in such a big way. And then it's like, ah, 2007, a little too late, I think, for me, for the PS2 stuff. It's also, I, I mean, it's also like a, the Shin Megami Tensei stuff was a very serious, like, not, uh, it wasn't for people who liked JRPGs, you know, blanket statement. This right. was a very, like, serious uh, series, uh, basically up until Persona 3, and it became a little bit more accessible. Um, not that this is not a serious game, because it is, but like, it's not, I don't know. I feel like the divide between the Shin Megami Tensei games and the Persona games is like, I don't even know why we relate them. They are very, very different. I, I had no idea, but on uh, Sakurai's channel, his YouTube channel, the creator of Smash Brothers, he was talking about uh, adaptations, and he pointed out that Shin Megami Tensei was an adaptation from a book. Uh, originally Whoa. as well, which I had no idea mm. about. That's such a weird idea that this is technically an adaptation and then Persona is a spinoff of, off of a book adaptation. Uh, but uh, Charles and Elise, uh, wow me. Persona 3, how are you feeling about it so far? Like Elise, I guess I'm most curious about it because Charles, I've heard you talk about it in Game Informer podcast, I guess technically, <laughs> but Elise, you're coming in out of the blue. How are you feeling about this? Yeah, okay. So um, I had played Persona before, Persona 3 before, but I had never finished it. Um, and I am about 16, like 15 to 20 hours in. Um, so I think like the end of June is where I'm at. Okay. Uh, I am really, I'm really liking it. Um, I'll be honest, I don't, and I kind of knew this already, that it's, it's not going to be my favorite Persona. Um, and I think that just like the... Uh, the main cast doesn't click with me in the way that it did in Persona 4 or Persona 5. Sure. Um, I don't find the social links as strong. Uh, and I find the music a little annoying. Whoa, but I know a lot of whoa, people... Whoa, okay, I'm sorry. Whoa, <laughs> That's whoa, the nicest thing I've ever heard I know, in my life. Gonna, I know I'm going to get a lot of flack for that because everyone's <laughs> always like, I love the Persona 3. But I'm like, why is there suddenly rap? I don't know. I just... It's, it's not... <laughs> the bar's high. I know. At least I feel the same for what it's worth. I don't <laughs> really? mind the rap part, but I in Persona 5, I found the music growing on me the more hours I got. And this is now I'm getting the part. I'm like, should I just like mute the game every time I come back? Oh, to the my God. Place? This is so Lotus it, Juice's uh, name, guys. They are. <laughs> Yeah, because at least Let's starting it up. the name Lotus Juice. Yeah, the rap, the rap parts, yeah. Okay, okay. It definitely was surprising, like, when you're walking around, like, that dorm area in the beginning, and then there's that rap song about, like, I'm chilling on my bed. <laughs> I was like, okay, this is <laughs> not what I expected it's, going it's into Persona. It's a little goofy. I don't, I don't hate it or anything, but... It, I just don't like the trumpet sound. Yeah. Well, because you're very particular when it comes to horned instruments, hey, Charles, I, right? This is I don't true. know what... I don't know if I'm in in the minority, but I do love the Velvet Room weird, like, haunting, uh, you know, where they're just, like, doing that chanting. I don't know. I like that for some reason. Um, maybe that's because I listened to a lot of Evanescence growing up. But, like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we've been there. But I love the Velvet Room tunes, so. <laughs> uh, Kelsey, now, I'm sorry, you need to be number one expert of all things Persona in this podcast, and I hope you're okay with that sure. role. But. <laughs> Fair to say the soundtrack to three is beloved or is just Persona three and yes. four and five equal love for soundtracks? Um, all, all considered very good. Yeah. Um, so I have played every version of Persona three, but not every version to completion. I've completed three portable twice and, uh, started the original PS2 one, which is the, it's the worst way to play Persona three. Don't play that one. Okay. Um, and FES, but uh, didn't finish that one either. So I've, I've played through the entirety of this game a, a few times and then started it a couple more times Jeez. than that, which is which is kind of wild because it's a very long RPG. Um, 
And they did, like, the music is different in this one. They re-recorded a lot of it. Um, I think that I really didn't want to agree with people on Twitter who were like, oh, this version of Mass Destruction is terrible. Like, they ruined it. Um, it's it's worse, though. It really is a worse version of the, that's like the main battle theme. Um, yeah. With the rapping, with the really good rapping in it, guys. <laughs> is this the one that starts with, like, the first fight in the game? The intro as it's like getting into the combat, it's like baby, 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 baby. Is is that yeah. is that a default for That's every? Not at all. How it goes, but yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. That was, that was a little more Justin Bieber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hint yeah, of Holly Hunter. Baby, baby. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think that sounds right. It doesn't sound like a song I heard. Uh, okay, Kelsey, there's so many avenues here. Uh, people in the Discord are asking. Is this, since you've played all the versions, is this the best version of Persona 3? If they want to check this game out, is this the one to go to? This is the best version of the worst version of Persona 3. Um, And what that means is uh, they added a bunch of stuff in both FES and Portable that are for... I have no idea what reason uh, not in this game. Uh, There's no female protagonist in this game, which is very like I, I just don't get it i don't understand why you would take that away after giving it to us yeah um her her social links are better it's <laughs> uh i think it's the better version of the game but um but i do think that if you've not played persona 3 before uh you should this is the one you should play this okay. is the one you should start with i mean i hate to be so callous and uh pessimistic but the reason that's not in there is so they can sell your persona 5 or persona 3 royal right of yeah like- I, yeah, I think they'll probably do um, the answer, which is like the added thing from FES. I think um, they either have already said they're going to sell that as DLC or it's just so obvious that we all believe it yeah. already. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know if they'll end up doing a uh, I think I think you might be right. I think it might they might just repackage it as royal and then add the uh, femme protagonist yeah. route, which is yeah. Not cool, guys. Not cool. Um, so I was listening to the Bombcast, and Michael Hyam was on that, and he was talking about being obsessed with the Persona 3. And his pitch was, it's the greatest RPG about death and about reckoning with death. Like, that is the yeah. overall theme of what's going on here. And I was even surprised, like, starting it out, where it's like, I've really only started Persona 5 and maybe played, like, the first 10 hours or so. Um, and so I'm very naive when it comes to this series. But starting out, like... It just starts out like somber and atmospheric and there's coffins everywhere. It's like, oh, I I was expecting like a jazzy soundtrack to hit me over the head uh, with motion graphics like Persona 5. And it's like, no, 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 no. This is just a slow, somber start to this experience here. And is that is that the hook or why do you keep coming back to this game so many times, Kelsey? Yeah, I mean, this is in much the same way that your favorite Pokemon game is the one you played when you were 10. Sure. Uh, this, your, your favorite Persona game is the first one you played. Um, so I, I recognize there's some bias there. Um, but this is, uh, by a pretty wide margin, my my favorite Persona game. I, oh, wow. I find the, the tone and the story just really interesting. Um, I, re- I really do like all the characters in this game. Some of the social links are pretty weak. That this is... This is the first Persona game where I feel like where where they kind of started on this new like uh, calendar system and the social like it's it's the first modern Persona game okay. I guess is is what I'm getting at. So yeah. like they're definitely still experimenting with some things in this one, and you get some really lame social links like your classmate Kenji who wants to bang a teacher and <laughs> uh, okay. you know just <laughs> some there's some there's some I'm not in that one because it feels like a train wreck, but. <laughs> I guess that's true. Like the way to advance that social link is to just keep telling them that. Yeah, yeah. I keep saying, keep go for it, dude. Decisions. I'm like, keep going. I, I'm so invested. That's, <laughs> that's like, like the, what the game wants you to do too, which is great. That's like the first time, like in the game, you'll get the text, and he'll be like, "Hey, you want to hang out?" I'm like, "Nah, man. <laughs> I don't want to talk to you about our teacher. That's weird, dude. We can go get ramen with someone else." <laughs> Uh, yeah, who is it? Um, uh, you'll call me Rob in the Discord. Said that he wanted to hear your thoughts on all the new team member interactions and if you had any personal favorites. Yeah, I mean, I'm liking the way they're handling. So I, I'm not as far as I'd like to be so far. I'm only in May, um, so I'm like 10, 12 hours in, something like that, um, or maybe I'm at the end of May. I just finished midterms, um, so. 
uh, I haven't gone, I haven't had a lot of those yet, but I had sure. one with, with Junpei, um, where we like went to the arcade and it's just a little bit of extra, I mean, Junpei's not, not the most strong character at this point in the story yet, I guess is what I'll say. It gets a lot better. Um, but, uh, I like I like that extra layer. They've done a lot of things in this version of the game to kind of make all of these interactions feel a lot more meaningful. You know, hanging out with these uh, with these friends, especially the ones that don't have social links. Um, they do in the female protagonist route, but they don't in this version of the game. It's confusing, but you can see why I'm like a little annoyed by some yeah, of that stuff. It's like totally. why those were those were good. Um, but this kind of, it's like an, it's a decent bridge between those. It's like, okay, you still get to hang out with them. You still get to like see them on a little bit of a deeper level. Um, and then you get like some stat boosts from it. So you get some, uh, you get some good combat things. I think they have done a fantastic job with the combat, um, in this game. I think they have done, uh, a really good job making the dungeons better, uh, in a way that is not, look, these were just randomly generated terrible dungeons in the first version really? of this game. Okay, like they, <laughs> they've, it, it's not going to be Persona Five, um, but it's it's brought it to a Persona Four level, I think, in this game, which is a perfectly passable <laughs> dungeon. <laughs> is is my feeling. Um, Charles and Elise, have you guys played Persona Three before? Um, I. I did, but I had never finished it. So I probably okay. got around like 15 hours. And then I, my brother kept playing at the time. So I like watched. So I kind of like my knowledge is a little bit all over the place because I watched like some spots here, some spots there. Yeah. But this is my first time. Like, I'm like, I'm going to fully, fully, fully play through this. And um, but I, I agree with you the way you're talking about the battles. Like it feels it looks better. It feels better. Um, I I just really like what they did with them. Um, I, and I'll be honest, I I feel like Persona 5 has the best gameplay of the series that I would love to see this treatment come to like Persona 4 as well because it just feels really sleek. Yeah. Charles, what is your journey yeah. here? Regale us, please. <laughs> My journey. Uh, I, I played Persona 5 and I beat it. And then I was like, I'm going to play Persona 5 Royal because it's supposed to be better. And I never got through that because it's really hard to play <laughs> 200 hours of the same game and actually not beat it a after all that time for the second time. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm like halfway through a Royal playthrough that was like a year ago. And then I came to this game. Um, and yeah, I think I think there's I it's hard for me to appreciate the improvements because I didn't play the older stuff. And so the only things that stand out to me are things like the dungeons where it's like not as good as Persona 5. Um, but I I still, I'm like, my big journey with this game was like coming at it for what it is and not like what I want it to be. And I'm liking it on its terms. Um, I'm also, I'm like 35 hours in, I think. So I'm in like oh, nice. August. Dang. Um, and definitely... I, another thing I miss from Persona 5 is there's a very clear like clock in that game of it's you know why everyone is doing what they're doing for this month period. And then in Persona 3, it's more like we know when big things happen, but there's not as direct like character actions for all of that, I guess. That's just like a thing that personally I, I helps me move through a long, long game like this. Um but once I stopped waiting for that and being like, you know what, I'm just gonna hang out at the arcade today. You know what, we're just gonna we're just gonna sit in what this vibe is. Um, I have appreciated it more. Yeah. A cool thing that they added in this one, which I I, I have mixed feelings about, but I think it is a cool thing. Um, is there's a button you can press to pull up like what other people spent this day doing. Um, like your friends. So you can you can see like you know thirty two percent of people went to the Tartarus, which is the big dungeon in the game, um, or you know forty percent of people did these social links or whatever. Huh. Um, and it was a good reminder for me because um, even though I've played this game a lot of times, I mean there's a lot going on. So I saw um, when I pulled that up once, uh, it was like you know, this amount of people hung out with uh, Maiko today, which is like the little girl that you meet at the shrine. And I was like, oh, her social link is available now. Like, I need to go start pursuing that That's one. I did, I forgot, you know, it's not available at the beginning of the game. It opens up sometime in May. And I was like, oh, okay, I can go, like, I can go start talking to her now. Um, I might have just waited another month before I even realized that I could have started 
that social link if it weren't for that little reminder. So um, I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it takes away a little bit of the like, no, like we really just, you know, live your life. The whole, the, the game opens with the whole like, hey, take ownership for all of your actions. Like you have a finite amount of time left and you need to, you know, think about what you're doing every day and then do it and like commit to that. Um, and I think, you know, checking, like peeking at what other people are doing kind of takes away from that a little bit. But at the same time, I find it like actually useful, even if it, I don't know, maybe doesn't fit narratively. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, I am obsessed with it as a concept. I want that for I want that for my whole life. Every every <laughs> moment. I don't know if it's just my general social anxiety, but just to be like, here's what most people are doing. Here's what most people get from McDonald's. Here's what most people enjoy as a movie the most. I'm like, tell me that. Let me let me know what to do to be as normal as possible in any given scenario. <laughs> Whatever's in the majority, I am there. I promise yes. I will be cool. I swear it. What is everyone's favorite Fast and Furious movie? And how can I make sure I have the same opinion? <laughs> oh yeah. But then, you know, it's yeah, going to be a it, lot of like, you know, a majority of people are also looking out the window occasionally and checking their phone and scrolling on YouTube. You know, like, I think it'd also be kind of comforting to be like, oh, they're, yeah, no one's really that special. No one's running laps around the house at three o'clock in the afternoon here. I'm doing fine. Yeah. One yeah. percent of people are actually getting work done right now. And it's Ben Hansen. <laughs> hey, thanks so much, <laughs> man. Yeah. And I can text you whenever you want, Leo, just to crack you into shape. It'll be fun. Crack me into shape. Crack me into shape. Uh, I think that would be weird to have an RPG like this, though. Like, I, it'd be tempting, but I would feel the need to, like, well, min-max the time, or I would flip it, like, you know, every time in a Telltale game where it tells you, you can see the percentages. Like, mm -hmm. I'm disappointed if I chose whatever the majority is. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, I want, I want that number to be, like, only 10% of people chose the path that you did type of thing. And if it's like, oh, it's telling me what to do, I feel like I might be too much of a contrarian all the time throughout every day of Persona, which, again, I don't think you're supposed to play games that way. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you'd do a very, I don't think you'd have a very thorough playthrough if you went against the grain too much in Persona. If you were just like, I'm just going to spend every day at the arcade and not talk to anybody. Yeah. <laughs> you'd not have a very good time, I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Overall, um, I think this is a very good version of this game. I think if you haven't played Persona 3 before, um, this is a great place to start. Um, I think you should go in knowing and expecting that it is like, it's the darkest of the... Uh, you know, I haven't played Persona 1 or 2, so I'm going to say it's the darkest of the Persona games, but it's the darkest of the ones that, you know, people talk about. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but they've added, it's actually something that's a little weird to me is because they've added this Persona 5 coat of paint all over it, like the UI is this like splashy, you know, it's, it's really exactly like Persona 5 in terms of how it presents things. Um. I find that kind of jarring. I'm like, I'm like, no, no, we're depressed right now. Why is this? Uh, why is this so flashy? Um, <laughs> but I don't. I don't think it's a depressing. Like the day to day in the game is not depressing at all. Like mm. it is a. It is a dark concept. I mean, like you like you said, it's a game about death, and it's a very good game about death. But in in being a game about death, it's also a game about like celebrating life and uh, all the happy and silly moments that come with it too. But the main thing in battle is shooting yourself in the head to unlock your persona, yes. right? <laughs> yes, yes, two really cool bonkers. rap music. Kelsey, do they do they ever be like, hey, this is why I feel like I've played this whole time and maybe I missed it, but I never knew why they were doing that. It was only no. eventually. Okay, okay. No, I I <laughs> It's because it was 2006 and it's cool. It, that, that was really <laughs> cool to, yeah. I was wondering how that stuff held up with, with modern sensibilities. I kind of assumed there was a really good reason for it. No, I mean, it's referenced where they're like, why does it have to be a gun? And then that, as far as I remember, <laughs> is never actually answered. Um, maybe it is. In, in, in like one of the dungeon dialogues, like as you're walking around, they'll just say stuff. I think they said something about like, you, you can only summon your persona when you face death in your mind. Yeah. Like when you are ready for okay. it to be like, this is the last moment of my life, okay. your persona will appear and then you can defy fate, I guess. It's kind of become but like... But then a, wouldn't you get really used to the fact that you know this gun isn't going to kill point. you? Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You yeah, need I mean, to come up with more elaborate ways of almost dying. It's, yeah. it's not pretty. We all understand that. Um, 
but it is like it's become this weird iconic thing of like oh persona 3 that's the one where all the kids from high school are shooting themselves in the head like it's it's become like Mm -hmm. powerful weird imagery i think for this game and not saying it's the right choice back in 2006 but it certainly has given it like that is the go-to signature look for this game is a bunch of blue and school kids with guns it's it's a weird vibe it sets the tone yeah (laughs) Yeah. I, the funny thing about it being a game from 2006 that is set in 2009, though, that like right. keeps making me laugh is the characters keep referencing like they need to run home to w- catch their show on TV. And I'm like, we had TiVo in 2009. We were all using it. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> uh, other big things, uh, Charles, are released that stand out to you about Persona 3 Reload we haven't hit yet? Um. I will say, I like at where I'm at in the game. Yeah, I know death is a theme. I feel like I haven't really encountered that super strongly yet. And my yeah. my understanding of the game is that like the third act really picks up and ties a lot of stuff together. Um, but I just wanted to say this: that's it's been like brushed upon, but I haven't mm. gotten to like the big heavy heavy story stuff yet. Yeah, yeah I mean, same same here. Um, I like. I mean, the thing is with these games is that even when you're 20 hours in, you feel like you're still in the introduction. Which is um, tough. And, yeah. Which is wild, but that's just kind of the, you know, the pacing of these. And that's something I keep in mind when I, you know, start a 100 hour RPG is just that like the story is going to take its time to pick up. Um, and I, you know, I feel like in a way, this is my first time with Persona 3, just because I never really got past that sort of introductory part, you know, of 20 hours in. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious to see sort of how all those pieces come together. And even if the, you know, the cast isn't totally clicking with me yet, like I, I just know that that stuff can change pretty drastically the more you play. Yeah. Uh, God bless y'all for going for Persona 3 at this time. 2024 is out of the gate so damn strong and the fact that like like a dragon is still rolling rebirth is right around the corner like just huge games are already here in addition to so many smaller games that are also amazing but leo you're still going with like a dragon right i am i put a complete pause on the story to do only sujimon stuff their pokemon clone mini game yeah i just i just beat that part too nice i, I it's you get the sujimancer job which is they say is uh, impacted by how good your Sujimon trainer rank is. So I was like, I may as well max this out before I even think about using this job. And it's been so fun. It's got the in-game gotcha. And it's I always love when you take like pay to win things like gotcha, those types of mechanics and put them in this almost like pretend sandbox where it doesn't right. cost you any money. You still get all the fun of like getting amazing pulls. And that's like, like when you buy a casino character. game on the NES or whatever, you don't <laughs> need any actual money. Never anything. need to go to a casino again. Yeah, it's just all right there. <laughs> exactly. It's very chill. And I really like the I, I'm not a Pokemon guy at all. I played it when I was a kid and liked it. But I really enjoy the way this makes the strengths and weaknesses. The fire beats grass. That's like almost all there is to it. That seems to be what matters the most is you get your one swap per turn of bringing in uh, the right type. So you're not being like weak to the person across from you. Yeah. And there's all these dynamics that happen around there. And then you just attack and you see the bright red line when you have uh, an advantage (laughs) and you go for that. And it's super simple, super easy to lose a bunch of time into. And I really love the way Yakuza has these like hidden podcast games within them. Like you can't listen to a podcast and get absorbed in that story or do side stories or anything, but like you can just set aside time to just grind this one thing and have a great time. Yeah. How important is it to get invested in that? And then also the animal crossing Island stuff. Cause I haven't hit can, either of those in a big way. It's completely you, optional. You can skip it. Yeah. It's completely optional. Um, like Leo said, there is like a, a job you'll be missing out on. Yeah. If you, if you don't engage with the Sujimon stuff at all, but, um, but you know, it's its own little, like both the animal crossing and the Sujimon thing, uh, like they are their own sub stories wrapped up in that. Like there are other characters and other storylines and stuff that you're going through, uh, while playing this. Yeah. And they feed into each other. You get a few villagers or visitors for your Dondoko Island through this Sujimon oh, arc. That's smart. And that, yeah. that island gameplay I really like, but I am taking my time with it because I know like the more I explore between visits there, the more visitors I can pick up. Yeah. And the Sujimon stuff doesn't seem to have as much. 
you can always hit those little uh, parking meter looking things that give you pickups as you're doing other stuff and then eventually come back to the Sujimon things with a ton of tickets for pulls. But I had no problem focusing on it and grinding through it. Oh, that's sweet. Uh, Kelsey, are you at the very tail end of Infinite Wealth? Yeah. Yeah, I'm in like the finale, um, but I I wanted to go through and finish. I didn't I didn't end up getting a five star island before I got to the so sorry. finale. But I I heard I think you can go back to it afterwards. Maybe you have to buy the DLC in order to do that. But oh, interesting. Right, new game yeah. plus DLC, right? Yeah, I don't I don't know if you have to do the new game plus in order to uh, get access to playing the island outside of the game itself or not i yeah. i i'm not 100 percent sure but um yeah i finished all the suchiban stuff uh like finished the whole storyline of that which is the uh discrete four that you have to beat it's like the elite four that's good that's good yeah <laughs> discrete mm-hmm. four. it's perfect yeah believe it or not the localization team over there knows exactly what they're doing when every step of the way with like a dragon that's unbelievable uh, we're planning on doing a max spoiler soon for Infinite Wealth. For everyone disappointed, we didn't cover it for the deepest dive. So there's going to be a, a bonus discussion about that coming up soon with the folks who have finished it. Uh, hey, Charles, can we talk about the most important thing here? The most important thing? Love for our, our friends and family. Aww. And hatred between Mario versus Donkey Kong. Um, this thing is out guys this week not get along. what is their problem i thought they finally patched it up and then this remake has to just drag it right back into our face this is the remake of the game boy advance game which is the sequel to the 1992 game boy game donkey kong um which expanded upon all of the original donkey kong arcade stuff so it's like a really fun lineage to track kelsey are you into the mario versus donkey kong series being a handheld junkie I I have the DS one, the first DS one. Okay. Um, and I th- there's a Game Boy Advance one too, right? I don't yeah. think I've played that. That's, that's yeah, there is, and is, I, yeah. I haven't I haven't played that one. I've played a little bit of the the DS one. Yeah. But yeah, there's there's a free demo for Mario vs Donkey Kong, which is the remake of that first GBA thing that I that I went through again. Charles, you ended up giving this thing an eight over there at Game Informer. You enjoyed your time with this thing. I did. I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would. I I kind of thought this game would be stupid. <laughs> I, I, it was always a series I looked at and I was like, this looks boring or I don't know. I don't know what it was. It just none of none of the the aesthetics were like bringing any bells in my head. And then I yep. actually started playing this remake and I was like, oh, man, Mario. Mario's got moves in this game. He's got like you do handstands. You could do big jumps. Um <laughs> But, yeah. but but if I may, let me just undercut all your enthusiasm and love for this game. Yeah. Because it's like, yeah, Mario, has, he can do some moves that technically are in the other games, but it's not like, if I may be so bold, it's not like this game feels great to control. Like Mario, one of the most satisfying characters in the history of video games to control. And this mm-hmm. is like, imagine that, but like a 30% clunkier version of it. It's like, I, I don't <laughs> think that's what I want. I think it's more of the way that at least in like the first few worlds, it's it's very much like, hey, by the way, you can do these jumps if you want. And there's like maybe one or two puzzles where you have to. It's just that after they introduce it, there's like six or seven worlds where you never have to do a pivot jump or a triple jump or whatever. Yeah. So it just feels like you're cheating the game to be like, I remember I can do this. I'm going to skip over these five platforms mm, and now I'm at the end of the level. Um. So I don't know. I have you played it? Uh, I like played this the one? I played the demo, uh, okay, which was yeah. like confusingly short. It was like four super small levels. And no offense to our dear friends Mario or Donkey Kong, but playing the demo, the sensation I had was this feels like one of those games that you could spend your time playing. I don't know why you would <laughs> choose to, but it seems like a fine thing to do. It was a great game to play. What was I watching? <laughs> oh no! Okay. <laughs> Uh, no, but it's not like, uh, I don't know. Like, I'm not engrossed in the soundtrack. There's no, what is it, Lotus Juice? <laughs> yeah, absolutely not. But there's a White Lotus is what you're movie. watching. <laughs> White, Lotus, <laughs> White Lotus Juice is a great before and after Jeopardy answer. Um, uh, uh, but no, I, I, I would, I would defend it a little bit. I, I found myself. Honestly, moving around, I wouldn't compare it to like an actual Mario game, but I right. liked it so much more than I thought I would 
that it just became like a very satisfying thing to do while I had something else on in the background. Just, it's definitely not like a I'm going to sit down and like laser focus on this game. Yeah, it's just, I, I get that idea of just having a series of fun bite-sized puzzles. Like it almost it's almost scratches the same itch as like a Captain Toad, maybe. Yeah, Is yeah. That a fair comparison. Okay. Uh, Super fair. And the premise of this uh, is Donkey Kong really wants toys. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, I really want to spend. I want to spend an hour talking about the premise of this game because yeah, I think it's so story. ridiculous. Donkey Kong at home watching TV. Mm-hmm. Donkey Kong has a TV. Ad for Banana comes on. Switches channel. Ad for Mini Mario. It says buy it now, buy it now, buy it now. Donkey Kong's like, dude, I gotta get one of these because I guess Donkey Kong plays with toys. I don't know. <laughs> Donkey Kong runs to the store. Immediately they put a sign up that says sold out of Mini Mario's. So he's like, oh my gosh, I can't buy the toy. But instead of like going home or going to a different store, he turns to the right and he's like, oh, the factory's right there breaks in and then instead of stealing a mini Mario, which is all he needed, right. he takes a burlap sack and steals all of them. Oh, Donkey Kong. Mario shows up and he's like, dude. Mar- Mario sounds just like that. Dude. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Donkey Kong is like, ah, and he runs away and then Mario has to chase him down. Um, so like the world building of this is what's really interesting to me because it's like, <laughs> are these... Are these Mario's toys? Is he manufacturing them? Or is he just such a like celebrity of this world that they have made toys of him and he happens to be... Because he's not in the factory with the toads that are making the toys. Right. He's just walking by outside as Donkey Kong busts out. But if you did note, and you have to frame by frame check it out, it does say Mario Toy Company. Mm-hmm. on. So I think he owns this toy company. Or you're but saying... The toys- it- are Mario toys. So it's a Mario toy company. So the company just started manufacturing. <laughs> it's like if they just started releasing, uh, I don't know, it, Leo, who's a celebrity? Uh, Pedro Pascal. Pedro Pascal toy company, but Pedro Pascal did not own the company. <laughs> Is that what's happening just license here? licenses like this, yeah. Okay. <laughs> It'd be weird to have it in the title. I don't know. It is weird. It is weird regardless. No. Um, but one of, one of the things I talked about on the Game Informer show is I went back and watched the old cutscenes from the Game Ooh, Boy Advance fun. version. Yeah, yeah. And Mario is so much meaner. And it kind of justifies a lot of Donkey Kong's behaviors a lot more. Because mm. he'll bust out of the factory. And Mario's like, hey, you big a monkey? <laughs> and Donkey Kong's like, whoa, what am I doing? And then he runs away because Mario's like a scary, angry Italian man. Um, right. <laughs> So yeah, and, but now Mario's that. like chill, and I'm like that's boring. It's I like every was. mascot has to get dialed down. Like you look at plain crazy yeah. like Mickey Mouse's first animated short, and he's yeah. just like attacking Minnie with an airplane. Like it's just weird, deranged <laughs> stuff early on. I feel like Mario is now, I think, fully out of that zone. But then again, like this remake, maybe bringing back some of those vibes, or even like Mario RPG. Every once in a while, you get that weird flavor of like off-brand Mario. Like I've been playing. Super Mario RPG and like there's stuff where when he's trying to tell people a story he doesn't talk but he'll just like transform into other characters I'm like this is such a weird thing for like Mario can just like he's just Clayface like as he's remaking <laughs> stories to other people this is so bizarre but that's the fun I think of them remaking these these older games and stuff but that's yeah. cool Mario vs Donkey Kong uh, on store shelves this Friday right Charles yep. okay sweet Elise do you miss um, doing Game Informer reviews I do. Do I you? Do. <laughs> like the act of like yeah. assigning a number to it and that whole thing? Yeah, I, I, I miss reviewing games in general. Like it was, uh, unless you're tasked with one that's terrible, but, um, but it, it was always, it was always fun. I like doing it. Um, Did you a give a 10 time. ever? I, I never gave a 10, no. I think the highest I gave was nine or 9.25. Do you remember what it was for? Wait, how many, how many 10s do we have at Game Informer? They started giving them out like candy, I think, after we left. Um, but <laughs> I don't think there's been one since I've been there. And I, I, I was in October 22 at the very least. So I think was hmm. Elden Ring the last? I think so. I think Wesley Blanc tried to give a 10 to every game he reviewed since then. But I don't think. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> no, I think it was like, I think it was his Lies of P review where he gave it like a 9.5. I was like, Jesus Christ. But you know what? Then I didn't play the game. So yeah, who am I to judge? Um, let's see. Every game that got a perfect 10 from Game Informer is an article that the gamer wrote. Now, Charles, I don't want to tell you what to do over there at Game Informer. It's every instinct of my being, but how do you all not have an article that's just every 10 Game Informers ever given at GameInformer.com? 
Um, I I bet you if you check the site one week from now, <laughs> okay, <laughs> <laughs> we'll have an article suspiciously similar to that. Oh, um, we no, get... I remember Kyle notoriously did not give Tears of the Kingdom a ten. Oh so yeah, nine point seven five. Yep, mm-hmm. sacrilegious. Um, that's like the last one I think that was probably deserving of a ten. Person. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, Link Between Worlds got a 10. Uh, Skyward Sword got a 10. Uh, Starcraft 2 Wings of Liberty, I think that's absolutely a 10. Arkham City got a 10, got a worth 3. You know, we don't need to do this. This isn't the Game Informer show. Save that for your cool podcast over there. How dare we talk then about Then you should Informer go back and make your first Game Informer review a 10. Just no matter what I'm assigned? Just whatever just it is. Yep, it. Whatever Mario they assign Donkey Kong. Ooh, ooh, yeah, yeah. Or if I go back for that Paper Mario Thousand Year Door review. I could bring justice yeah. to all those spurned fans by just being like, sorry, it's a 10. What, what do I have to do? I have to argue with Kyle or Shay about that? I could do that. <laughs> I could stand my ground like a beast to say it's absolutely a 10 out of 10. Print it. Print it or I quit again. Uh, hey, uh, Leo Vader. Hey. Your family's a big uh, Apple family, right? Big Apple family. Big, the big From Apple, New York. they call it. That's right. Charles. Your family's Peter made of Taylor. apples? Mm-hmm. Great. Scarecrow family. Great fruit family. Yep. Also, hey, you played Foam Stars League? You want to talk? No. Um, <laughs> Apple Vision Pro. I want to talk about it. Uh, it's, it's an odd thing, right? Uh, Kelsey, your uh, partner is a big Apple family, right? <laughs> and he's from the big Apple. Holy cow. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> okay. And I am fascinated by this. The only person I know in the world is Kelsey's boyfriend actually went and bought an Apple Vision Pro. I assume there is oh, some pre-ordered sort of- ordered it. Pre-ordered oh. levels. Wow. wow. Got it, like, pre-ordered it so that it was pick up at 10 a.m. when the Apple Store opened on day one. Whoa. Now, did he find gold in a river before this panning, or how does this work? This he, uh, he's a software engineer. Ah, he made a I better see. career choice than the rest <laughs> of us. He found gold in his brain. <laughs> um, okay, so you've tried this thing, right? At, at, at home, I presume? Yeah, yeah, okay. and I mean... And in his defense, he knows this is a product that's not for, like, yeah. this is not, this is a for funsies, like, very silly thing that is not, uh, I, don't, I don't know, no one needs to run out and get an Apple Vision Pro, I guess, is, is the takeaway. Um, <laughs> but it's cool. Like, it is, it is a very neat piece of technology. Um, I did some of the, like, I think they're calling it, like, immersive experiences or, or whatever, which are kind of like the... Um, the 3D video things that are all yeah. around you. Um, there's some cool dinosaur ones that are pretty pretty fun. Yeah. Um, and the cool thing with that immersive thing too is because I went to an Apple store. I bought a new MacBook and it just happened to be the same day that uh, the Apple Vision Pro went on sale. So it's this weird thing of like, oh, I can try this? And they're like, yeah, there's, there's no line. You can just go ahead and grab one, which had me a little bit worried. I know it kind of has like a groundswell of fandom, which is interesting to see online, but it was alarming to be in an Apple store on day one of a product and it seemed like it was quieter than normal uh, compared to an Apple store. Like maybe now it's picking up that word's getting out that it's cool tech. But anyways, um, specifically with that, um, like the environments, uh, it's, it's got like the cool little dial that you adjust that like slowly spreads it more and more around you until you're fully immersed in like some... Oregon coast or some nonsense like that for the little pre-built or stuff. Or the moon. Yeah. Yeah. I saw somebody online was playing the Final Fantasy VII Rebirth demo while on the moon. I was like, you know what? That's some good, stupid future tech stuff. And that is, I think, the appeal here. Yeah. I mean, that that's it. That's all I've gotten out of it. It's like, ha, huh, this is cool. Not like this is a useful piece of technology for our everyday lives. It's it's a it's a neat way to consume media. Um it works. I mean, it works well. It's an Apple product. It works well. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, I like I've had some fun playing around with it. My partner is using it a pretty good amount, like as his um, laptop screen, basically. Whoa, so, like, OK, that's fascinating. You know, typing on his keyboard, but like he can just place, you know, however many screens he needs around the room. Um, <laughs> and like. Even he will admit, like, hey, I think this is really cool, but I don't think this is functionally super different than, like, having two monitors or whatever. You know, it's just you can just walk around with it more and that makes it neat. Um, He can also, like, place a screen directly in front of me if I'm annoying him. Oh, interesting. (laughs) How dare you? (laughs) It it, it is fascinating, too. And I feel like, I don't know, I feel like an undercover cop or something when I'm getting demos like this because I'm just so, so fascinated by, like, how they're pitching it. 
And it's like, I'm, I'm secretly going to be taking notes on how these Apple Store employees are pitching this to me. But they were so big on that demo of being like, no, 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 no. This isn't AR or VR. This is the new era of spatial computing. This is the first in the new era of spatial computing. This is a spatial computer. It's not a headset. Um, and they were big. Multiple people were like, so what do you do for a living? I was like, oh, I'm a video producer. They're like, perfect. Imagine having multiple monitors around you and you can edit video in the Apple Vision Pro. <laughs> I already have that. I think I'm doing fine. Thank you. But they're just trying to find any angle that they can to get folks to buy it at this point. And I will say, you know, like I was really impressed by the MetaQuest 3 tech, um, but this does look a hell of a lot better. You know, it's still... It's not like it looks like reality. You know, you can still see a little bit of that screen door effect, you know, and you can still see some light coming down from below your nose. But it yeah. felt like the equivalent of jumping from kind of like a a cheap phone to an iPhone. Like it did feel like that level of quality gap, even going from MetaQuest 3 to this, especially when it comes to like pinching to like move windows around your room and stuff like that. Like this just feels much more rock solid than the Apple Vision Pro. Not worth $3,500 by any means, I'm sorry, Haley DeBoom, if you're listening, but <laughs> by all means, it's cool tech that you should check out uh, if you're going through an Apple store. Yeah, the only like real world application I can think of for this for, you know, being useful for someone is if you are someone who is specifically like has to travel all the time, you're like on airplanes, mm. on trains, whatever, and whatever you're working on is confidential. So like you need to make <laughs> sure that no one, no one sees it. Oh, um, yeah, that's actually a good point. Um, it's a use case, you know. Not, yeah. not a bad one. Have you gotten any like headaches using it, you know, for like a certain duration of time or um it it's not comfortable to wear for more than like 45 minutes. Um mm -hmm. for my partner, I think that's more like an hour and a half. Um as he's getting used to it or maybe he's got a better shaped head, I don't know. Um mm -hmm. but it's not like it's not like painful. It's just like, it's heavy. Like I don't want this yeah. thing on my face for a super long time. Yeah, but it is pretty comfortable. The strap in the back feels good and all that stuff. But the 3D videos got me. I thought that was really cool because you're watching like this 3D video in front of you. And their little demo one is like, ideal perfect family uh, at a birthday party, blowing out the candles in front of you. And the, the Apple store person's like, can't you just smell the candles? Like really trying to like bring you in the air. But it is like really- holding a candle so up. Funny. They should, they really yeah, should. Yeah, they have like candles they bring to you. <laughs> but it is, it's, it is really effective to have like a weird recreation of like a 3D space in front of you. And then the part that kills me is like, how it like fades out in reality around you. Cause it's using the pass through cameras in a weird way like that. Finding the edge of like, hazy memories if you really want to go full Philip K. Dick style on it. Like, it's just a cool thing to experience, but... Um, Rain dancing. Yes, it's exactly that for yeah. Cyberpunk. Yep, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's cool too because... Uh, if you're in like a fully immersed environment, you can look at like your panorama shots from your phone even and like fully look around them and stuff. But if there's a person there, it'll like lightly fade out wherever they are so you can still see them a little bit. Um, but it was like just the perfect demo case for the silliness of this tech, even though it is it is impressive of like I put on the Apple Vision Pro headset and they're giving me the full demo. Um, and as I'm fully inversed, it's like, look, look at this video of a rhino in 3D coming up to you. And look, look, you can turn this dial and suddenly you're in a whole nother world. Isn't this crazy? And meanwhile, like <laughs> I was with my baby and my baby was in like the carrier next to me or the stroller. Um, and it was absolutely surreal because I was turning up the dial to like fully leave this world behind. But then multiple Apple Store employees were going up to me and wanting to talk about how cute my baby was, which was very sweet. <laughs> and it's, it's the most flattering thing in the world. Uh, but everyone's like, oh, how old is he? I was like, uh, like seven baby? months. Yeah, it's like a weirdest feeling to be like, <laughs> you're undercutting your tech in such a big way to be like, yeah, you're going to some fantasy world, but turn that off because we actually want to talk about this real <laughs> baby next to you. And then I just felt like the biggest piece of crap in the world because I was trying to get through all this demo and my baby was getting like more and more hungry for his bottle, very naturally, baby stuff. 
Um, and so I could hear him getting fussier and fussier. And I was trying to talk to the Apple store employee, like, if you could just speed this demo along, that'd be great. Cause I need to get a bottle of that kid real fast. But she's like, Oh no, no. Don't you see if you go up, you can actually select Apple TV. Let me show you the options of Apple TV. And I was like, I, I don't, can we just jump to the game stuff? Like, can I just see what it looks like when you run like an iPhone game here on the big screen? Cause this baby's losing it. Cause nothing feels worse than having a baby start to cry as you're trying to fully, you know, envelop your world with the Apple vision pro. It's a sad sign of where we're all going. One last thing I want to say about it, though, the, yeah. the funniest application I've had of it is you can you can mirror your screen if you have a, an Apple uh, TV so you can see what the person wearing the goggles is seeing. OK, um, so my partner and I have absolutely played, uh, you know, first person video game, walk around the house like, you know, <laughs> pretend it's a <laughs> pretend it's a video game. <laughs> oh, fun. You know what? You find your own fun with the Apple Vision Pro. It's it's, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm curious to see, uh, you know, how everybody else is, is playing with this thing. It's fun to see people making fun of it online or be really enthusiastic about it online. There's definitely the people that are walking around with it in the real world, which it absolutely does not want you to do. But people trying to shoehorn that to make it work is a, a funny concept for sure. Uh, hey, uh, Leo. Hey. Hi. Do you know how this whole thing operates? A little website called Patreon, huh? A special thanks to everybody who supports us at any tier, the people that found the tier that is right for them. We greatly appreciate it. Patreon.com slash minmax with two ends. Even that $2 tier is unbelievably helpful. Try it for one month. We very much appreciate it. Thank you to some of our biggest supporters as well. I'm talking about fine folks like stamps.com. Stamps.com, everybody. They want to emphasize, hey, it's a new year. It's time to get in the groove. You know, I feel like the first month, first month and a half of the new year, you're kind of, you know, for me, I was just going through like all my old notes for Min Max and stuff I wanted to do, highlighting new things. Like, okay, for sure in 2024, I'm gonna tackle this. Now I feel like we're in the business groove. Now things are gonna start flying here. And that's where you need a company like stamps.com. And Kelsey, genuinely you're stamps.com's biggest fan on earth. I've seen your t-shirts. Um, you yes. are to stamps.com what your partner is to Apple. I think it's fair to say. <laughs> yeah, day one, early adopter, all of the new stamps.com tech every day. Smart, smart. Uh, stamps.com, it's a one-stop shop for all your shipping and mailing needs. For 25 years, stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses, whether they're mailing out checks, invoices, legal documents, books, or anything else, or shipping out stuff from a video game store, like uh, Kelsey Lewin there with Pink Gorilla in Seattle. Uh, get access to USPS and UPS mailing services. You need to run your business right from your computer anytime, day or night. No lines, no traffic, no waiting. And if you sell your products online, stamps.com seamlessly connects with every major marketplace and shopping cart. So you can keep your mailing and shipping moving at the speed of your business, Leo, which is quite fast. It's up there at the speed of sound, probably. Um, if you go to stamps.com, you can sign up with promo code MINMAX for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code MINMAX. Also, this episode uh, is sponsored by Fume. Leo, you remember Fume? Huh? <laughs> That's right. If you're out there trying to break bad habits, that is the goal of Fume. Fume is an innovative, award-winning, flavored air device that can help you break bad habits, is how they pitch it. Instead of vapor, Fume uses flavored air. Instead of electronics, Fume is completely natural, which is the most confusing part about it. It's, it's just a tube, everybody. Uh, and instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses delicious flavors for their flavored air. So if you're used to having some bad habits, you want to replace it with something that is air, uh, Fume is there for you. Um, also, like it, it slides apart here in this way. Like we did an ad read for it a couple weeks ago, and I genuinely have enjoyed having this on my desk the entire time because it's like got good finger grooves here. If you just need a fidget spinner and you are perfect, and you don't have any bad habits, the design of this fume thing also very, very satisfying to spin around every which way. Have you been hitting it? Uh, I breathe air through it, no doubt about it. Nice. Are you daring me to do it right now? Yeah, take a massive cloud. Okay. Rip it. Rip it. <laughs> That's air, baby. Wow. Uh, so you can start the year off right by going to tryfume.com slash minmax and getting the journey pack today. Fume is giving listeners of the show 10% off when they use the code minmax. So tryfume.com slash minmax. Use the promo code minmax for 10% off. Also, thank you to our dear friends at IM8Bit. They want everybody to know about Day of the Devs. 
As Tim Schaefer so proudly declared on the podcast a couple weeks ago, uh, Day of the Devs is now a nonprofit organization. It's an official 501c3, and they need your help. They're currently accepting donations through February 29th. All proceeds for Day of the Devs as a nonprofit entity go towards the cost for various events throughout the year, including one this March. And if you don't know Day of the Devs, that's the big... Uh, big group, a big event where they get a bunch of indie developers together, get the public in to actually check out these developers. Nice place for indie developers to show off their games, interact with the public, get some feedback, interact with each other, which is one of those secret benefits of all these events. Day of the Devs is a very cool event. I can't wait to go to the one happening in March. Um, so for GDC this year, Haley and Janet and I will be out in San Francisco. So at least some of us are going to be going to Day of the Devs in person here. So you can help support that by going to daythedevs.com. And they have a bunch of bundles there as well for your donations, a physical bundle and a digital bundle. And you can help support im 8 bit by doing that. Or you can go to im 8 bits wonderful online store because they are quite cool. And you can use the promo code LEAPFROGYEAR for 10% off of everything in their online store that's under $100. And that's not an Atlas uh, Persona 3 soundtrack. Um, everything else under $100, 10% off by using the promo code LEAPFROGYEAR. Check out im 8 bits wonderful online store you will not be disappointed it is quite cool and help support im8 bit because they support the minmax community in a big way by shipping out a prize each and every week to whoever has the best questions submitted over there on patreon and this week whoever's the best question wins the gravity falls double vinyl soundtrack they'll just ship it to your damn house and all you got to do is support us on patreon and submit a good question for us so thanks to im8 bit and that's why they deserve your love all right ready to go for community questions Tommy Carver Chaplin, right, said and says, hey, CLCs, how different do you think you or your life would be if you never played your favorite game? Ben, if you had never played Final Fantasy VII, for example. That's a great question. For me, yeah, I, I don't think I'd be nearly as into games if I had never played Seven. Seven really kind of opened my eyes in a big way. And it's like, yeah, I, I probably would have gotten around to an RPG at some point, but... I don't know. I think that game just hit at the right time for me in every way. So I don't. I don't think I'd be having this job if this is a job. Um, but yeah, if you all dodged your favorite game, I don't think you'd actually change you. Um, I well, geez, I don't think I'd even have some of the same friends. To be right, honest. that's the biggest like, difference. Yeah, there there are people I met because we bonded over our favorite games. Um, like one of my. One of my friends, yeah, is literally like everything was just because of Mass Effect 2. Um, That's awesome. And uh, I don't know if anyone here knows Natalie Flores, uh, yeah. who was from Fanbyte, uh, also like a, a former video game journalist. But um, she wrote the whole reason of our friendship was that she wrote a review for Paste on uh, The Last of Us Part 2, which is another one of my favorite games. And and I reached out saying, hey, I really, really loved your review. Here's why. Uh, and that's how we became friends. And it's possible that we, I would have never worked at Fanbyte or I would have like, you know, there's that, that whole connection and that friendship, like definitely was a whole new avenue. Yeah. Life. I would still have all my hair. You think so? Dang. Yeah. Because it, Rainbow <laughs> Six just uh, made you tear it out in frustration. Is that the idea? Because Hitman. Uh, I, I got it. the joke, Leo. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <So>. you. <laughs> yeah. She's got your back. Um, yeah, I, I devoted like a very uh, like foundational part of my childhood to moderating an Animal Crossing forum. Mm. Uh, and I just, I feel like that that set me on kind of just like the internet path, like what I know about internet culture and how to navigate that and like how I met people and stuff, like all kind of stems from that community that I joined because I liked Animal Crossing. And then yeah. I obviously I would not have written a book about Animal Crossing if I hadn't played it. That would be weird. So <laughs> that's true. <laughs> uh, what what type of thing were people talking about in that forum? Was it just like I need Sven to come to my town? Where is he? Type of stuff or what? Um, no, it, I mean there was like an IRC where people just talked about anything, and there was some general, you know, like not Animal Crossing related things, yeah. but. Um, it was it was a lot of this was for uh, Wild World actually uh, mostly so it was people like actually jumping online and trading things with each other oh, and fun. visiting each other's towns and um, there was a, a hack for a while that was a, a big problem in the community where like you could 
go into people's towns and drop like a whole building in their town and then that would just that building would be there forever and you just ruin someone's town <laughs> that's pretty good it's big big drama in the animal crossing community <laughs> yeah uh charles if you never played lego star wars you'd be a completely different person today <gasps> you know ben i was sitting here just like <laughs> I don't know if I have like a game like that. Like I have a lot of favorite games. It totally is Lego Star Wars though. That was like <laughs> really the amount of times I went around like as like a five year old being like because that's how old I was when this game came out. Yeah. Being like, do you like going to like kids in kindergarten? And be like, do you like Legos? Do you like Star Wars? Well, you're gonna love Lego Star Wars. <laughs> and like that was a. Why do I, I have the thing for you? <laughs> What's I have a take memory to of someone being like, like, "Yes, Charles, I know Lego Star Wars exists. I have played it." And me being like, "Oh, I guess I say this a lot, huh?" I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Well, because it was like I didn't even have like my parents never played video games. Yeah. And it was like my dad's college friend was like, "Hey." your kids like Legos and Star Wars, I got you this computer game and dad like went and got like a new graphics card so our old computer could run a video game. Ooh, that's good. That's good. And then from there, they were like, I guess these kids like stuff and that's how I got like later video game consoles (laughs) because I was so into Lego Star Wars. That is something that feels a little bit lost. I know, I know everyone's still upgrading their PCs left and right, but like every PC upgrade as a kid, it was like getting two new generations of consoles in one. Like, it was such a huge, momentous idea. It wasn't just like, hey, yeah, you can run Cyberpunk and it'll look 10% better. You know what I mean? Like, hey, now it's in 4K. I guess that's kind of for all console generations, right? They felt like bigger leaps back in the day, but it was just like such a wild time of like, what do you mean I can play Age of Empires 2 now? Like, that's just (laughs) incomprehensible that that's now an option for me instead of just walking down the aisle and just assuming that I couldn't run anything on my old computer. Uh, Nick from Atlanta writes in, and they say, Hello, Elise. Oh, hello. Uh, I just want you to be aware that on the most recent New Show Plus episode for MinMax, uh, they did a show called Thirst Council, where they reviewed the community's crushes. They, Hanson says. Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, they, they had this show called Thirst Council. There was some mask there. Who knows who that was? Yeah, they still haven't identified that mask stranger. Very handsome, though. Um, anyways, I want you to know that uh, Thane from Mass Effect 2 came up and he was shoved near the bottom of the stack for the tier list for video game crushes. Can you please inform Ben, Leo, and Kelsey why this is wrong? I don't know why I'm included there, but why was it wrong to to do Thane that dirty? Well, Thane is the best love story uh, in Mass Effect 2. Um, I I don't know how much I should be spoiling here, but it's... It is a heartbreaking story. Let's just say that. Um, and he is an incredible assassin who also has a spiritual side. Um, you know, like he he can relive all of his memories just sorry, just like that. She's getting excited. Um, and wait, whoa, whoa, so I don't know. I I love Thane. I think he he is the best romance of the whole series. I, he can relive all of his memories. It's like a Mary Lou Henner thing. Apple Vision he Pro he has visions <laughs> where he like it, yeah. <laughs> Where he can just like immediately relive like things that had happened in the past. Oh, like you'll have okay, cool. but how do you get over him being a weird bug guy? <laughs> <laughs> how do people? Um, you know what? I I'm fine with him being a bug guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's better. It's better than. Garrus being a weird bird guy. Okay, now you've gone know. too far. At I'm least. just I'm just saying, like <laughs> he's got weird like. <laughs> I just feel like I wouldn't want to touch Garrus's skin. Like, at least the other guy's, like, smooth skin. You but know? at least, if I may stand up for Garrus <laughs> and his sexuality, he's got, like, pupils. Whereas Thane, he's just got yeah, it's dolls eyes. eyes. He's got shark's <laughs> eyes. You know, it's like, it, it, it's just, you're looking into a black hole of nothing. Oh, my God. I'd like to have our backstage pass chat here chime in on if they prefer bug guy or bird guy. <laughs> <in general. laughs> Please. Uh, Claudio, so I'm sorry we did Thane dirty. At least. I'm sorry they did thing dirty. Um, okay. Claudio writes in and says, Hey, Min Max and friends. Leah, how are you feeling about that um, Thirst Council in retrospect? I psyched for episode two. <laughs> Wondering what we're going to put up against it to be <laughs> defeated. <laughs> I mean, I feel like the Hitman streams has to come back as to something to try and take it down. I think that's yeah. a contender. It, do, when we want that. do you think House Hunter Rise, if we brought it back, could defeat Thirst Council episode two? Episode three or four, maybe? I don't think episode two. (sighs) Okay. Uh, Claudio writes in and says, Hey, everybody. um, Could you all please open your Steam library 
sort by the most played and let us know what the top couple games are for you. So there's a way you can do this if you go into your library and then go to top played. Um, what do y'all got for actual number one on Steam? Um, actually, let me open that right now, but I'm pretty sure mine is is just Phasmophobia. Oh, uh, I yeah. I feel like I bring it up all the time. No, <laughs> no, you're not on the podcast enough to, to bring it up all the time. <laughs> three, I mean, 300 hours and Phasmophobia, but I mean, I like... I have some other, like The Sims 4, I probably have something like 1,500 hours in. What? But that's not on Steam. Like, I play it through the, the EA app or whatever. Jesus. So. Are you a, did you get into Lethal Company? Oh, yeah. I love Lethal Company. Okay. Uh, but I only have seven hours of Lethal Company. But I, I need to play more. I've really liked it. Yeah. That's so wild. Um, I feel like these Steam stats, <laughs> some of these are like, I don't know what's going on. My number one most played game on Steam is... At 191 hours, super hot. <laughs> I don't think that's... <laughs> oh, that must just be like idle time, right? It must be like, look, I like super hot. I don't think I liked it that much. <laughs> Something's up. And then this is also fishy. I I don't think I spent those time. 132 hours for Far Cry 3. I was like, I like Far Cry 3 as much as the next person. I don't think I, I don't think that's accurate. Um, this one, XCOM Enemy Unknown then is at 121 hours. I was like, yeah, I, I, that's... that's Probably some idle time in there, but I could see that. And then Elden Ring's at 100 hours for me. That's a, that's a top four for where I'm at. And I understand I'm a baby gamer. I'll take all your shame for not being in the thousands of hours for these I, things. I have a ridiculous 162 hours into Puzzle Pirates on Steam. Puzzle Pirates? Which, like, I still go back to, you know, and actually it's way more hours. Like, I've it, this is an old MMO from, like, early 2000s. Right. Like 2004. So I have, like, way, I'm sure I have thousands and thousands of hours, um, but it came onto Steam maybe, like, six years ago or so. Um, and <laughs> since then, like, I, I was just like, oh, this is great. It's accessible for me again. And I love playing Carpentry in that just to, like, chill. So this... I boot it up and I just play the puzzles. Man, it's got, like, every type. It's like they got Bubble Bobble in there and a bunch of other just, like, little match three games as you're going around yeah. as pirates. Yeah, a lot of match, a lot of match three games. It does um, look good. Yeah, but I like, I like the carpentry puzzle just because it's like, I don't know, the shapes and stuff. So. That's funny. <laughs> it's fun. Uh, Kelsey, were you into that? Um, I I don't play a lot of stuff on Steam. It's probably still League of Legends, but that's from long time ago. Sure. Or like Stardew Valley or something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Charles, what are you sitting at? Uh, mine is pretty cleanly Baldur's Gate 3. Um, I also not, I'm not like a mainly Steam player, uh, um, but I have <laughs> 96 hours of Baldur's Gate 3, but the playthrough is actually like 130 hours. I just got it on PlayStation 5 and kept playing it there because it looked better. <laughs> um, but yeah. yeah, second place is Fallout New Vegas. It was like 80 something. Nice, awesome. nice. Hmm. Dead um, by Daylight is up high for me too. Yeah, what's that at? Anyone plays that? Uh, that is at just at a hundred. Okay, just at Haley uh, McLean is. So if you ever need a a teammate in Dead by Daylight, reach out to Haley. She's got you covered there at least. Nice. Yeah. Um, my top three are Siege, Red Dead Online, and Hitman in that order, and none of those are on Steam for me. On Steam is Tabletop Simulator, two hundred eight hours. Wow. Then Rocket League at hundred and fifty eight. Or the notable from the top ones. And the finals is already at my like eighth most played at Whoa, 86 hours. Really? Still playing that? Yeah, all the time. Yeah, I noticed when, I think it was last week's episode, we were talking about verticality in games and how rarely it's pulled off well. And I saw you in the backstage pass chat say, the finals, it actually does it and it's cool. It's very cool because what's vertical can become horizontal very quickly. Uh, that's right. With explosives. <laughs> uh, Blake writes in, and says, hey, in last week's episode, you asked for stories about crazy orders at restaurants. Yeah, keep these coming, everybody. This is what I want to hear from everyone who works in restaurants. Um, Blake says, I worked at Red Robin and had someone order a burger with every type of protein on it. So it was beef and chicken and fried chicken and ham, as well as every type of cheese and condiment that we put on sandwiches. And this burger was over fifty dollars, uh, but technically <laughs> one burger. If oh. someone says that, can you not just be like, no? <laughs> that's like a prank, like not like yeah. a. They're not going to actually sit down and eat that, right? That's that like something dude. they did for TikTok. Yeah, one of those stupid Leo Vader drive-through videos, no doubt. 
Um, they had an earpiece, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I want to... Blake, I'm curious if you actually saw them bite into it. Because when you're just biting <laughs> into the entire barnyard, I am curious to see how a mouth can possibly handle that. Um, Adam Roberts writes in, and they say, hey, response to that weird restaurant order question from last episode. I'm a flight attendant, and on a flight from Chicago to uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul, a first-class passenger ordered a Diet Coke and Bailey's mixed together as a cocktail. There's no <laughs> way this is a Minnesota thing, right? Huh. No, it, that's the Minnesota specialty. That's our estate drink. Uh, <laughs> we all grew up having it around the Christmas tree. Whataburger has a Dr. Pepper milkshake. That's not bad. Ooh. So Flavor wouldn't be, profile's similar. Yeah, maybe that wouldn't be too bad. I could see it. Hmm. Um, hey, speaking of Minnesota stuff, that's not a Minnesota thing, Adam. Don't put that on us. But this was something that came up recently, but budging in line versus cutting in line? Do you all, is this a Minnesota thing to say budge? I've never heard. Budge. Is that a synonym for cutting in line? Woo, Kelsey, Seattle? This yeah, I, no, absolutely not. Leo? That's not what budge means. Yeah, what does budge mean? Like to like nudge or like. But like, you're, you're thinking of the word nudge. <laughs> yeah, I well, guess that was kind. Of, if you don't, hmm. if it doesn't budge, it doesn't move, right? Yeah. Mm. Okay, mm. so a a budge is a nudge where the object moves. I think uh, so. I think you push something and it budges, right? Yes, you yeah, nudge the thing budges. budges. You nudge. Yeah. You nudge, you they nudge budge. A- I think that's it. Exactly. Uh, but Leo, right? Did you you grew up with budge as well? <laughs> Ubiquitous. Yes. Budging in line. Yeah, and for sure. Like, and you guys I, do that I, weird I both, gray yeah. duck thing. We got the duck, 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 duck gray, gray duck. duck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What we're, is that? We're, we're freaks in a lot of different aspects. Yeah. That one makes sense because the Swedish something, something, something. But um, <laughs> it's like, oh, because it's like in Sweden, they called it Anka Anka, Gris Anka or something. And then like it's a lot of Swedish immigrants and they brought that over. But the point is, yeah, that's such a weird thing. We're like, yeah, cutting in line is one of those things like, I I know what that means, but I just would never say that. Whereas I feel like all school, all the time, it was just, hey, this guy budge, don't budge in line. Like just budging in line was... Yeah, ubiquitous. That was just the obvious it, thing. It feels childish to me now. I think I always say cut in that you do. situation as a grown huh. grown man. Very old. Yeah, I really no like Minnesota. It feels like a tiny little alternate reality. Like Thank where you. just a few little things are changed. Otherwise, it's a, it's normal. Yep, but. yep. It's right. the best rides on premise. Um, Dr. Ock says, hey, in honor of Valentine's Day, what's the best couples game? It takes two. Do you think so? But that the game about divorce? <laughs> <laughs> or about the parents it... reconciling. Yeah. And in love again. <laughs> I do think so. I think some of the platforming is a little challenging in there. It depends on like, you know, where your partner's at for yeah. enjoying video games. But yeah, I think that's a good one if you want like a long journey for sure. But Leo, I was thinking about you because you, you play so many co-op games with your sweetie. I sure do. <laughs> Farm Together is my fourth most played game on Steam at Whoa. 130 hours. Which is a great couples game because it's split screen and simple and not a lot of opportunities for disagreements. <laughs> it's like very easy to just like, I'm going to go flush out this part of our farm and decorate it. I'm going to go focus on grinding us up some money here. The only time there was any type of uh, potentially, you know, a potential dispute was when I would spend all of our money on seeds. And I would say, it's so we can make more money. We're going to make more money so soon. <laughs> But she was uncomfortable seeing that that bank account low. Oh, that's interesting. It's good so lessons. it's a kind of a good dry run for for budgeting together as a couple. Yeah, we call it cutting. Um, Sent the profit writes in and <laughs> says, "I'm determined that one major reason for Microsoft's failure to sell the Xbox is their insanely stupid, mystifying naming scheme. The fact that PlayStation went from one, two, three, four, five, so that even my grandmother understands what's going on 25 years later, while Microsoft went from Xbox 360 to something as insane as the Xbox Series X. I can't even say it without thinking I'm about to say sex or a model of an airplane. What's the difference? Uh, the public is confused, and this had to have hurt sales in some way. Uh, Nintendo messed up Counter with point. the... Yes. Oh, sorry. I thought you were done. But <laughs> counterpoint, Nintendo. <laughs> yes. Yes. Sent the Prophet also says Nintendo messed up with the Wii U, but they salvaged it nicely with the Switch. And my bet is that it's called the Switch Pro is the next model. Oh, that would be confusing again. New 3DS, oh. new 2DS XL. Yep. Trash. They, yeah, I work in a used game store. They want a used new 3DS. <laughs> it's nonsense. 
<laughs> Do you, but is that a counterpoint? Because is I don't know. I mean, the new 3DS is one of those things that did, did it secretly sell like a gazillion units. I know the 3DS is the most is the best selling thing overall, but like I do think those confusingly named ones it maybe didn't help their case overall. Um, it's it's still better. Like at least those are just the iterations to me. Like Nintendo, yeah. it's yeah, like that's true. If I was making up names, I'm like this is the Bob and the Super Bob and then the Grunk Cube and then Smish and Smash and Smosh. And they're all just very <laughs> different. Like, I don't know what these are, but eventually I'll figure out the order they came out in. Whereas the Xbox, it's like, if you just had the names, you could never even begin to come up with like <laughs> yeah. the chronology of Xbox 360, one, one X, Series X, Series S, one S. Right. But it looks like you should be able to figure it out. It's like a puzzle. Like, I can get this. If I sit down and focus on yeah. it enough, I swear I can figure this out in timeline. Yeah, that's a good... Nintendo isn't great about it, but it's at least like something about the system. And it is so random on Xbox. Right. Any of them could be the name of any of them. Yeah, it's it feels like the Star Wars sequel trilogy. You know, it feels like every entry, it's somebody taking a different direction. And then when you just look at them back to back, it's like, this makes no sense, you guys. You can't have an Xbox and then an Xbox One just two generations later. It's not happening. <laughs> that um, is that is the worst offender, I think, yeah. of all of them, is the Xbox One being the third console. Mm -hmm. in I think that's where the trouble started. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I really did. They should have gone for calling it the Xbox 720, just like uh, Real Steel predicted on all the screens in the background of that boxing movie. Um, but don't you see, guys, it's the it's only the one input you'll ever need for your TV. That was their pitch when they revealed it, remember? This yeah. HDMI 1, everything goes through here. And it was true. Um, <laughs> G writes in and says, Hello, MinMax. With the release of another code slash trace memory, the re-release, uh, a game I loved when I was in middle school, it's got me thinking, what were some of your favorite games growing up that you wouldn't recommend now, but you still have a soft spot for? And Charles, you can't say Lego Star Wars. Oh, whoa, you really stole it. You stole it <laughs> up my throat. Lego Batman. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh. uh, my actual answer is, uh, uh, I, I don't know if I talked about it on this show before, but Sonic and the Black Knight was a game that I feel like I only I played because my dad went to the Toys R Us or whatever, and he was like, I got a kid. He's turning nine. What are kids like? And they're like, Sonic and the Black Knight came out yesterday. And then he bought it for me. And I was like, this is so cool. Sonic has a sword. It's not going to get better than this. And then no one ever talked about it. I saw, like, I think Game Informer has a ranking of the Sonic games, and it's, like, near the bottom. It's fine. It's a fine game. <laughs> yeah, but I wouldn't recommend it. You can edit those stories now, Charles. Honestly, if you just move that to the number one Sonic game of all time on that story, <laughs> no one would call you on it. You should I don't want to have I don't want to have that discussion. Brian Shea would definitely. He's, he's the Sonic guy. That's right. It is his homepage. I forgot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, I wonder, I bet Sarah played Sonic and the Black Knight. That seems like something she either streamed or played as a kid, so she could get your back on that. Um, yeah, I think most it, games we all played as kids, right? It's just like, wow, there's no universe well, really I, recommended. Yeah, I kind of feel like almost universally, kids just don't have the best taste. <laughs> like, <laughs> you just kind of hone into something for very specific reasons that don't always make sense when you're older. Um but for, for me, a lot of it was, like, licensed game. I think we've talked about this before, Ben, but, like, the Aragon game. I don't Ooh, know if anyone yes, had that song yeah. Books, but, like, that was a game that I loved. It was, like, a third-person action-adventure game. Um, And a lot of it was just, like, just not very good MMOs from the time, browser-based MMOs. There was one called World, and I, like, W-H-I-R-L-E-D, that no one played, no one knows what that is, like, literally except for me. <laughs> Um, it was alive for maybe like five years and then it was defunct. Uh, it went offline, but yeah, just kind of weird stuff like that. Is someone slamming their mouse onto their desk repeatedly? What was that sound? It might've been one of my cats. Oh, really? Is it slamming a mouse, like a live mouse onto the desk repeatedly? I don't know what they do when I'm not looking. <laughs> All right, so. that's confusing. <laughs> no, I think like the licensed stuff is, is like the perfect thing. Like you love it as a kid, but. In reality, it's like, oh boy, that's rough. Like, small soldiers on the PS1, I will defend to my dying day, but I don't know if I should. I actually might be in the wrong. Multiplayer might not be as cool as I thought it was. But then the one that I loved, and at some point I think it'd be a fun stream to go back to it and just, like, can I just, can I actually beat this game and what would it be like? But uh, Bart versus the World, specifically on Game Gear. Like that, 
game was rough, but you got to fly around as Bartman on like old Chinese sailing ships, and that was a really mm-hmm. cool level. So I don't think anything can be wrong with it. Cool. It was cool, man. <laughs> yeah, I feel like the Wii era probably had the most of those for me that I was into at that age, but would not like now. What Your Elibits is. Mm. Your Rampage World Destruction, whatever the name of that one on the Wii was. Oh, funny. I didn't know they made one for the Wii, but of course, of course they did. Of course. Uh, not- I feel like the Game Boy was a really big... Uh, a big area for that too. I was I was always a handheld child, so I had tons and tons of Game Boy games that were, you know, like put a ton of time into like the Powerpuff Girls one. I'm sure that's terrible going <laughs> back, you know. Uh Not Weirder writes in this Hey Man Max, on this week's episode of Bonus Pod, uh the Patreon exclusive podcast, I talked about my current university experience and its connections to games slash minmax. And one example is that I learned that friend of the show, Elise Favis, went to the same school as I do. More specifically, while you're recording this podcast, I'm starting my second month hosting at CJLO, the same college radio radio station, station. there we go, that I found out had a show helmed by Elise Favis 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I was able to find her very first episode of her radio show, and I have to say I was super impressed by how thoughtful and professional it was, particularly the nuance she brought in her conversation about LGBT, uh, LGBTQ uh, representation in gaming. I was wondering if she has any insight or perspective on that show 10 years later. Oh, man. That's a blast from the past. Uh, yeah, I did I did that a video, oh my gosh, a video game themed a show. Uh, it, it was <laughs> it was interesting because I started off as me, like I, I pitched it to like the college radio station and they were like, yeah, go for it. That sounds great. Um, but I was like the only, I was like just the host. And the, the first episode is just like me talking and using like clips from different things, um, which sort of worked and was okay. And then I think a few episodes in, I start having like guests on um, and then finally had like actual co-hosts. But yeah, that was, it was, I think looking back, it's kind of funny that I thought I could do a like one woman show of just me like doing like continuously stream of consciousness. Um, but yeah, it was uh, that, that that was fun. I, I actually think that that show helped me get the um, the Game Informer internship because I sent them mm. clips, uh, and I think they they liked it they, or they liked my on air personality or something. And um, that that I the first time I applied to the Game Informer inter- internship, I didn't get it. Uh, and then the next time I was like, okay, I got to do more. Like, I was like, I got to just write more and like start a blog and whatever. And I'll start a video, like a video game radio show. I did all of that to like try to get to Game Informer. Wow. So, wow. And it worked. Yeah. Mission accomplished. That's sweet. Yeah. Um, it's funny. I think it was at GDC last year. Um, we were like out at karaoke and this karaoke person there, somehow Minnesota came up and that's where we're from. Yada, yada, yada. And she was also from Minnesota. And, uh, and I was out with like Tim Turry, formerly of uh, Game Informer and stuff. And it turns out she had applied to be a Game Informer intern and she was rejected <laughs> and she was so spurned by it. And then she actually like pulled up the email that Tim Turry had sent her as a rejection. <laughs> to, like, oh, no. uh, she's very sweet about it. She's very sweet. And now she works in PR and stuff and she's helped out a lot with Trivia Tower and codes and stuff. It's just a funny weird connection. Um, Sly Cut writes in um, and they say, hey, everybody. Um, on this week's episode of Bonus Pod, Ben and Jacob dove deep into the analytics of MinMax. Yeah, that was a fun episode. Um, if you're a geek for numbers, um, it was said that Twitch is MinMax's smallest audience, and it raises the question: Why doesn't MinMax stream on YouTube, where the audience is bigger, instead of or in addition to Twitch? Watching a live stream on YouTube is much more enjoyable, as the ability to pause and rewind alone is huge. Um, on that note, also, why are you using Twitter polls and not YouTube polls, where the audience is the biggest? Um, this is good bonus pod discussions for going behind the scenes, but uh, we can have it here because Leo's interested in talking about it. I'm curious to hear his insight yeah. about it. I think a lot of it comes down to, I don't want to annoy our YouTube audience. Um, it's our biggest audience. I guess the podcast audio feed might be bigger overall, um, but it's our biggest audience. But like, I don't want to have a bunch of YouTube polls in that feed. I don't want a bunch of live streams in that feed for like gameplay streams and stuff like that. I like leaving it just for like the reaction streams seem a little more, I don't know, worthy of your time if there's something we're doing a reaction stream. And so that's why we do those on YouTube. And so I think part of it too is like, yeah, um, the subs from Twitch do help out financially um, in a bigger way than I think super chats and stuff would. But 
Leo, you're smarter than I am. I, I, we're definitely behind the times for like, Twitch has gotten rid of their exclusivity stuff at this point, right? So there's technically not a reason we couldn't simul stream to both? Yeah, and there wasn't really a reason before, but, but, but besides the point, I, I, I think, I don't know. I, I, at this point, the way we do solo streams, the way they go to the MinMax Stream Archives channel, just mm. more casual gameplay streams versus the stuff that makes it onto our channel. Yeah. You know, there's no real way to do that if we stream everything on YouTube. It would be it would be deciding that all of these gameplay streams are pretty much main feed public stuff, or at least to the point where they get, you know, people get notifications about them. Yeah. In their YouTube feed. But I agree that it's... I, I guess I don't know what... I, in general, I have no idea how people grow audiences on Twitch, and it always feels like it's just a runoff of any success we've had on YouTube. Yeah. It's people tuning in for Twitch stuff and the reaction stream being on YouTube versus gameplay streams being on Twitch and new show plus being on Twitch. The distinctions there, I feel like are, will never be clean. Yeah. will never be immediately understandable. And that kind of <laughs> hurts looking at the big, the big picture, mm -hmm. but I don't know that it's something that we could or should just cut off because it also is a place where people are just more used to giving money to streams joining memberships on youtube are pretty much exactly the same down to the the cut we get of them i believe if we were to get that set up okay but i don't know if people have the same success streaming on youtube as as they do on twitch yeah and, I, and I, I do i know it's confusing that like oh we do new show plus live on twitch every tuesday at noon and then one day later it goes to youtube but i do like having that because for New Show Plus and some of the other streams and stuff, I kind of like having Twitch as kind of like a first draft of our content, especially for doing like live streaming in the world for a New Show Plus episode, wandering around. Like it's nice to have that option of like, okay, this is where the signal cut out and the stream was unwatchable for these two minutes. And so being able to snip that and having a clean version for YouTube, I kind of like that system, just cutting off the intros and outros for most of our stuff, but just having one one option you get a 24 hours to clean it up before youtube sees it and hopefully enjoys it more than the twitch audience and there are people who like our live stuff and our pre-recorded stuff and there are people who only like one or the other i just like there yeah. are plenty of people me included i just like don't really ever watch streams it's just not part of my day-to-day mm -hmm. -day content consuming and so there is a perk there of having it be separate feeds for people that are still like you don't necessarily you won't necessarily miss anything that happens if you're just tuned in on YouTube. Right, right. Uh, which, by the way, we should plug again. Yeah, we do have uh, MinMax Stream Archives, which is our secondary YouTube channel where all of those, all of the Twitch streams get sent over there, uh, like the solo streams and stuff like that. Uh, so you can check that out. Um, Adam Walters writes in to say, Hello, MinMax. Um, can, I, can I put a question out to the audience? Sure. Um, what is the coolest thing you've ever done as part of your job? My answer is I work at one of the major auto companies in Southeast Michigan on hybrid and electric cars. And one time I was part of a hot trip, which, which has the sole purpose of testing in development prototype vehicles in the hottest conditions we expect a vehicle to see. We first went to Arizona where we let the cars bake in direct sunlight for hours. <laughs> that does sound fun. We drove up steep inclines and we maintained a hundred miles an hour on a, uh, miles an hour on a test track. Others on the team drove through Death Valley. Next, we drove to Vegas to put the cars through stop-and-go traffic again while it was very hot. We also drove up Mount Charleston near Vegas. It was an exhausting 10 days. That sounds hot, Adam. I don't know about how I feel about that I want to go on the cold trip. Yeah. Go on the mild trip. Yeah, please sign me up. I'm looking for room temperature testing of cars. <laughs> That's my ideal journey. Um... I don't know, like, Elise, is it just, like, the travel we did at Game Informer? I'm trying to think of what would... Yeah, I mean, like, Control going to Remedy in Finland, that was that was the best. Right, yeah. you and Leo, that, that yeah. That was the coolest trip. I, I, I had a ton of fun with that one, um, just because I'm a big Remedy fan, too, that it was kind of a dream come true. Um, and they have an amazing office, those big glass walls, and Finland is just so cool. Yeah, we went yeah. on the trip together, and it's a, my, one of my first go-tos for, like, cool travel I got to do with Game Informer, for sure. That's sweet. Great trip. Even though it was like freezing cold in February. It was, it was, it was cold, but whatever. We Minnesota between Minnesota and there. Yeah, it's all the same. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this kind of counts. I think um, at the community TV station I worked at before Game Informer, I made a video that was about preventing car theft, theft from your cars type of thing. Like, hey, here's how to 
stop people from breaking into your car. Um, and so we were working with the police on this. And then as part of that, we were able to like get a car for filming a scene where someone was breaking into the car because we had to film this whole elaborate thing, um, which was a whole process and it was very fun. Um, but the cool part then was after we were done filming and like breaking open the window for the video, um, then we like brought the car back where we got it, which is like some junkyard somewhere or something. And, and the person who let us have the car was like, yeah, by the way, whatever you want to do to this car, have at it. And he just like gave us a couple of baseball bats and we just got to beat the <laughs> crap out of, out of a car like it was Street Fighter 2. And it was nice. unbelievably fun. Uh, so yeah, I guess that's probably number one for me over any of those lousy developer trips. was just being the hell out of a car. <laughs> I've got to meet some cool people. Yeah. Some, some, some YouTube contemporaries. It's really cool to have like some mutual respect between that's like a really surreal thing that pops up once in a while that I, my mind never knows how to make sense of. Like, uh, what type of stuff? Where do you meet them? Um, a couple of stress started supporting me on Patreon and I noticed their name and message. I'm like, Whoa, Holy crap. This, there's mutual admiration here. Yeah. And Twitter mutual follows and stuff. And yeah. Love it. Uh, Christian Jimenez writes in and says, hello, question for Elise. Uh, do you play your games in English or French? Uh, I play in English all the time, but, uh, I actually played the, uh, gosh, what was it called? Um, why am I forgetting right now? The, the series with the, the kids and the rats that they just Plague Tale. Plague Tale, like Requiem and stuff like that whole series. Um, any game that is either based fictionally in France or, uh, is from like a French studio and yeah. has like really good voice acting. That's just in the native language. Um, then I usually try to switch it over to that, but otherwise I'm always playing in English. Like English is still my first language, so it makes the most sense, but um, but yeah, like I, it's, it's always fun to do that. That's sweet. Uh, pro number six says, Hey, Ben and friends, in an effort to get better, I've replaced doom scrolling with micro learning lessons while reading up on the Roman Legion as the first organized military. I learned that a cohort originally referred to a group of about 480 legionnaires. <laughs> 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 time to grow those numbers <laughs> so and then we can start calling ourselves legionnaires too that'd be pretty sweet that'd be sick um <laughs> thank you charles so more sick. more accurately uh the computer loving cohorts should be called the computer loving contubernium as that <laughs> relays a group of about eight rolls yeah. off the tongue <laughs> it's really good <laughs> also minmax's patreon number would classify it as a legion technically Interesting. Okay. Oh, that yeah. rules. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, Leo, I'll quiz you uh, in the future next time you're on. Computer loving contubernium. Please don't forget it. Okay. okay. Um, what was the name of your Contuber second favorite game from last year, by the way? Shadow Game with the Cursed Crew. Damn it, Charles! You were on that episode. I forgot about that. Nice. Um, Ad Hage Borley <laughs> writes in and says, I was recently playing Chia, and I love that the game never told you exactly where you were on the map but had the character make an educated guess. It made me realize that I missed that feeling of being lost in an open world. Do you think more games should incorporate this more? Yes. Yes, please. It helps you forget that you are a little dot on a big open space. And when you look at a map, you say, I'm a little dot on a big open space and I'm moving <laughs> horizontally. I mean, can you define what like lost in an open means are you like not actually losing your way but just being able to go off the beaten path or what like i specifically think of when i think about this um like my first experience is playing minecraft and how exciting that was for me like before you have a map in that game mm -hmm. and just having those moments of like okay i'm building my house in this valley and then i'm gonna go sailing or go exploring and then it's that feeling of like genuinely having to look at like where the sun is setting to try and figure out like, oh, where do okay. I get back? Am I just going to completely lose my house at this point? Like that type of feeling of like, I, I genuinely, this world feels infinite and I could lose my bearings. It's such a rare thing to have in games, I think. Okay, mm. I'll be honest, I don't like that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's just because I'm I with you. really, I have a bad like inner compass. I don't mm. know about you, Kelsey, but I am really bad Awful. at directions in general. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. I need a waypoint or I need some sort of general direction to know where I'm going. 
I need I, more mini maps in real life. I I, wish we had a mini <laughs> I lost everywhere. <laughs> I like the feeling of overcoming that. Like like getting lost is not exciting to me, but in like Ben's Minecraft scenario, like when you find your house again, you're like, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm an inner compass. I know where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> Too hard. You, I want to like, do it. <laughs> you learn the area better. Like sometimes I'll not have the GPS on in my car because it's like oh, I no. want to tr- at some point know the names of the streets around me. You know, I don't want to rely on GPS so much. I remember in Red Dead Online, my friend Sam and I once were like, let's turn the minimap off, not look at the map and just try to navigate mm. between these two cities from like Tumbleweed to Strawberry. And how humbling that was of like thinking we were on the right path and getting so, so lost. It took like hours to make what should be a pretty short <laughs> journey. But by the end, we like knew the environment so much better. That's and fun. it's always just more immersive for me. I have mini map off whenever I can. I think uh, Helldivers 2 does it really well. Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ryan Jake writes in and says, uh, the world needs to know the cohorts is, I don't know who cohorts are. We're, we are con- contuberniums. Um, health and fitness routine slash tips. Are y'all exercising regularly? No. <laughs> I started going to a strength training gym and I'm really excited to say that um, they're not very big weights, but I am already starting to lift what looks like a very funny, because I'm, I'm very small. So just putting a, a barbell above my head with weights on either side Um I just, I just want that to look ridiculous, and it does. It's great. <laughs> but this is like an actual right. barbell. It's not just like a Lincoln Logs construction kit little thing. Oh, it's that like a, like- I think it's like a thirty pound barbell, and then, um, you know, not heavy weights. Like sure. we're, we're like ten pounds on either side right now. I'm, st- I'm getting there. Hey, that's uh, sweet. But I, that's awesome. I just started going a, a couple of weeks ago. I've, I've always done. I've always been pretty good about just like doing little YouTube home workouts, like just something. So mm-hmm. I'm, you know, not, not totally. Uh, lazing away all the time, but um, this feels like I'm actually getting somewhere rather than just, you know, doing some crunches on my floor or whatever. Yeah. Mm. I I was listening to uh, some podcast and they were doing an ad read for like, this drink makes me feel so much better every day and clarity of mind and all this stuff, yada, yada, yada. Um, And I was just flummoxed to get listen to it because I'm like, you know what really does that is exercise every day. Like I know we've talked about it again and again and again, but if I bike in the morning, I feel so much better uh, mentally throughout the entire day. It really clears my brain up in a perfect way. And it's like, it's just that weird reminder of like yeah, exercise, the basics of it, it is free, everybody. Everyone's trying to sell you a lot of stuff, but if you just exercise <laughs> every day, you will feel better about your life. Like, I'm sorry to be old man screaming about it, but it is absolutely true, at least for me. And I've started, um, when biking in the mornings here, I don't know. Look, I'm an idiot when it comes to everything, but especially when it comes to any sort of exercise or physical thing whatsoever. But I have like a a weight. I don't even know how heavy it is. I'm that dumb. Um, but as I'm biking, I'll just like do as many curls as I can with it in one arm and then switch and do as many curls as I can with it in the other arm. And like that combined with biking for an hour, like by the end, I feel like the Incredible Hulk. It's like, Jesus Christ. And I've noticed like, oh wait, now pull-ups and push-ups are easier as well. Like, is this making me a lot stronger just doing this every morning and it's super easy? It's a very satisfying feeling. I think it's from holding a baby. Oh yeah, that's probably mm. true. We did get one of those lead children. Right. I, I think I, I started stretching when I had really bad back pain almost a year ago. It, I suddenly had like a spout of it and was you know, immobile on the floor. And I was like, I want to make sure this never happens again. Yeah. So I've stretched pretty much every day and it has, it has warded it off. And I was looking on the podcast to do talking about doing cardio a while back. And I want to shout out Canadian in the community who DM me and said, jump rope is a good, like home yes. stationary, yep. easy way to do that. And so I got one and I just this week and I've been doing it a few days and I don't want to do it too much because I have a downstairs neighbor, but just a few minutes is, is plenty <laughs> for where I'm at. Yep. No, it's, it's huge. That was, I think my first, better quest goal ever we did that back with cork because i would just go in my backyard and do junk jump rope in the beginning of every day and it was it's fast and it'll wear you out like it's it's Mm -hmm. really it's really good um beefcake writes in testing out some stand-up material they say uh do people named nancy have to say n as in nancy when spelling their name over the phone (laughs) yes they do yes they do if you if you're victor (laughs) yeah that's right it just flows off the tongue 
If you have jokes you're testing out for your stand-up, write them in. We want to read them. Um, Rhett says, Hey, Min Max, um, I work in research and development for a food company, and I've had the opportunity to work on a variety of different products that have launched nationwide in retailers such as Target, Costco, and Whole Foods. The one I'm most proud of is the Good and Gather Cranberry Jalapeno Dip for Target. That was you, Rhett? Hell! Uh, nice my job. question for the panel is, if you were given the opportunity to R&D a new food product, what would it be? I don't, I don't know how to, like, I don't know what's possible in the realm of making food. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I have, I have... I have a dream of there being like more convenient grab and go lunches that are fairly healthy. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Like I, I like a, I like a rice ball. Like we don't really Ooh, have them yes. that much in the States, but like rice ball with some meat inside. You're like, okay, I'm getting some protein. Rice isn't like that bad for you. It's, you know, it's filling. Um, but like, I just, I want more of that kind of option to exist, but I don't know. I don't know enough about food R and D. Like, what what are we missing that that doesn't exist? Why is that not? I assume it's impossible, or we'd have it already, right? It might just be like U.S. rice uh, appeal <laughs> that we're lacking <laughs> compared to other countries. <laughs> but I, man, I mean, they, they've got to be popular in Hawaii. You would think that. Yeah, I'm totally with you. Like, I want something to be able to pick up quickly in a gas station. That's not going to make me feel like I want to die. And I do feel yeah. like just that little rice ball, it's exactly the type of thing. Put some seaweed on that. That's a done deal. But I don't know what it is. Wait, missing. does it need to be like quinoa or something? We do a quinoa ball? Mm, sure. With meat inside okay. or something? Yeah, I'll take that. All right. Take that to Costco, please. And uh, figure that out. Come on, Rhett. My, my million dollar idea was always mint chocolate chips. Like oh, you buy yeah. a bag of chocolate chips. People like mint chocolate chip. Why not make like mint chocolate chip swirl? Then you get mint chocolate chip cookies. I think they exist. They do. Uh, well, it's because <laughs> they knew about me. Well, hang on. Yeah, I'm seeing here the inventor is worth tens of millions of dollars. That's interesting. I was so I like actually that. did used to. Okay, this does exist. I did <laughs> used to work at a uh, chocolate store, like for a. It was like seasonal work. So it was like a uh, Christmas. I worked at this chocolate store and they were like, Charles, you have any ideas? And I was like, mint chocolate chips. And they were like, whoa, that's such a good idea. Um, so I don't think they did it. They're not rich now. But if, <laughs> if they did, that would explain it. I feel like I Googled it 10 years ago and it wasn't a thing. But okay. Also, hey, hey you're, you're set. Hard. You're all good. Um, speaking of R&D, I, I was driving this morning and you know that situation where you're merging into a lane, but another car is also merging into the lane and there's just nothing you can do. It's like, Constantly gauging, like, are they coming into this lane as well? Okay, I guess I'll back off. How have we not? I feel like car technology, it's so over the top. There's a thousand features, yada, yada, yada. You got backup cameras that you could shoot a film with. Why aren't there blinkers on the sides of cars to account for that very specific scary situation? Does any blinker have a side? What, like, on the, on the side of a car? Why isn't that an option? Don't, don't have, your mirrors have... Some mirrors do, I suppose. I have, uh, and my car has sensors on the mirrors where, like... Uh, or, I don't know if it's the mirrors. But, yeah, there's sensors on the sides where if there's someone merging over, um, it'll, it'll make a sound. That'd be nice. It, it makes a sound to let me know. Okay, that'd be nice. I just I guess the mirrors is the solution, but when that's so rare... I would just, I want like, just a, just give me a little beacon in the center of like the passenger door or something, just to let me know if this is potentially coming over to my lane. Just stick your arm out the window. Oh, like that's smart. Yeah. Uh, Michael Berry writes in and says, if given an opportunity to appear in a video game, which of these options would you prefer? Have your likeness digitized similar to the original Mortal Kombat fighters? Perform in an FMV cutscene? Have your movements translated to a character via a motion capture suit? Or do voice act? voice acting for one of the characters. It'd be cool if there could be a Pokemon designed after my likeness. <laughs> Your physical body? <laughs> no, but like, I don't know. They could get creative with it. I don't want to actually look like a human. You know, I want to look like a cute furry Pokemon, but um, so like somehow. Com combine your body so with an like animal. My, no, not necessarily. It could be like my hair could be my personality traits or things I like just somehow all collaged into this, this being. Yeah. What about if they're like, okay, Elise, you can be 
<laughs> the inspiration for this Pokemon in the next game, but you have to do mocap for all of its like attack animations and stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I'm sure I would if I was in one of those suits be uncomfortable. But in my mind, I think the least stressful version is the motion capture stuff. Like, I don't think I'm going to, I don't think I'd get stage fright from just swinging my arms around and stuff. And they can edit that. Yeah, I would True. hope so. Edit the fear off your face. <laughs> I, I do like the idea of zeroing in on a, an animation. Like, what do we want this to look like? And really practicing it for any yeah. specific one off you know, roll animation or whatever. That seems fun. I, I assume that's a hard job. Like that's not, you don't just walk in and they're like, okay, you know, run. And then you, you nail the run on the first try. Like Leo, did you try mocap with me in Finland or did you not? Was it just Shay and me? It was just you and Shay and I filmed it. Okay. And okay. It was yeah. supposed to be for the intro of control, but I don't think those characters made it <laughs> no. in. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> that was totally them joking. Yeah. 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 Not, They're definitely control. uncomfortable. You feel very goofy wearing them, but uh, yeah, it's, there's definitely an art to mocap for sure oh, that yeah. I 100% did not master in the 10 <laughs> seconds I was in one. <laughs> Uh, let's yeah, see. it's hard enough to like take what you're doing super seriously with cameras and a crew pointed at oh, you, but yeah. wearing the suit with the balls on it and yeah. a bunch of dots on your face and like trying to uh, and just like sell that little props and stuff and swinging around and being goofy. Yeah, it's a skill. Ryan McGinnis writes in and says, "Howdy, Ben, and esteemed guest. Uh, new words and phrases that are coming out all the time. <laughs> True, Ryan. Twerk and Riz were even added to." the dictionary because they became so widely used. Do you have any words you and your friends or partner or family use that you made up? We use the word blomp. It's basically extremely relaxing to the point where the entire day is shot. As in, I'm just blomping today. Or can we just blomp? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Got it. I, I use the word goob. Um, That's good. To describe my cats. On. Oh, okay. Um, so when they're, if they're being crazy, I'm like, oh, they're gooby. They're goobing out. Right. Um, and the origin is I saw like a TikTok of a cat and they, the caption was like, he's goobing. And I was like, that's so funny. And I just started <laughs> using it. But uh, that cat's name is Gooby. So they were just oh. doing a play on this cat's <laughs> name, Gooby. It's goobin time. And I have just taken it as my own cats of like. He's goobing. I opened the door just now because my cat was goobing outside and I was like, he needs to come in real quick or he's going to knock something over. That's good. Yeah, goobers, it, it's also just a good, soft, fun insult for people too. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. goob in general should be used a lot more. And then mm -hmm. Google to see if there's any negative connotations to it. Yeah, no, goob's clean. <laughs> Has um, goobs. My... This is obvious. Okay. My partner says um, tea kettling for like when one of our pets is like shaking and scared, <laughs> which I think is kind mm. of cute. Um, but I, I don't know if that's like widely used by anyone else, but I've only ever heard her say it. And I think it's adorable. <laughs> tea kettling. It is cute. I, I think most just inside jokes in my life have come from misspellings of things. And it happens a lot because of my partner's phone uh, being really bad for typing. She called soup whoop once. <laughs> so whenever we talk about soup, it's whoop. Yeah, most of most of my words are just mispronunciations of words. So um, I find it very difficult to say the word basket correctly now because we say bastic. Um, the I think the weirdest one is probably um, Dr. Pepper is Dr. Bappus. And it's to the point where my partner will be like, can you get me a Bappus? And then I'll have to, like, I'll go through the drive through and I'll have to think about it and be like, a Dr. Pepper. Uh, don't ask the person for a Bappus. They have no idea what that means. <laughs> this is language. a tangent, but uh, uh, when we went through the drive through in high school, the Wendy's drive through which was a daily activity, uh, we the running joke was to try to get the one driver who was always the one placing the order to ask for a McChicken to just just like slip it into the group's order. <laughs> good. Get a McChicken from Wendy's and when he fell for it, that's a good moment. <laughs> <laughs> Highlight of your life material. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, what do y'all like for question of the week? Backstage passers, jump in there and, and share your picks as well. Um, I like the most played thing on Steam. Basic, but you know what? I like looking at those numbers. Um, let's see. I like that if you never played your favorite game. Yep. Yep. Mm, never played that your favorite was game. a good one. Uh, the one about Elisa's old college radio show. 
they did their research. I like- yeah. I like that one a lot. I I like the research as a concept, just generally. Okay, like, Elise, make Elise feel special. Do you sign off on feeling special on this very I special do. day? I was. I thought that was really cool. Um, it is, and look, I'm leaning that way as well. But I want to shout out in terms of research, talking about the Roman Legion. That also was a research one, but that's true. That's a good one. All right, let's give it to not weirder. There, congratulations, you won the Gravity Falls double vinyl soundtrack. Thanks to I am Eight Bit, and now it's time for something that we call get a load of this. <laughs> All right, jump on in if you got something good. Leo, wow us, baby. Hey, get a load of this. This is uh, perhaps a niche one, but uh, Fuser, now delisted. Uh, It took me forever to get modding going because it sounded intimidating to put modded songs in it, but I I did it in like 10 minutes last week, and it's so worth it. So my get a load of this is the link for how to do it and the spreadsheet of thousands of modded songs you can throw in there. It's been so, so fun. If you're at all interested in that technology of remixing, mashing up any song together at any key and somehow making it sound good from maybe encountering it in Fortnite where it, that technology lives now, uh, I recommend it. And you can get Fuser from the internet without paying for it necessarily. Interesting. Interesting. So we've something to look into. We've been given a choice. Uh, do you have a highlight so far of the song that's in there? Uh, I was jamming with Thriller this morning. Ooh, Obviously a great one that they never could implement uh, legally. Yeah. And Well by Jacob Collier, I recommend as one of those just goat songs that makes any mix work. You know, there's a few of those and they all stand out. Oh, that's fun. Uh, Charles, do you got one? Get a load of this. <laughs> Okay, uh, I was just looking this up today. I have I have a yellow orange no sorry an orange tabby, and she's a girl my cat. Yeah. Um, the odds of orange tabbies being female are only one in five. What? Um, because the orange I'm gonna mess this up. I do have a picture it's like to remind myself. or something. Yeah. I, so the, I know about that too. Orange is on the X chromosome. And if you're a female cat and you have two X chromosomes, they both have to be orange in order for you to be an orange tabby. Otherwise, you're going to be a calico. Mm. And male calico cats are even rarer because in order to be a calico, you have to have one orange X and one other X. So a male calico, which would a male cat, which normally would just have XY chromosome, would have to have an extra chromosome. That would have, that would carry the calico thing. So that's like a one in 3,000 chance. Jesus Christ. So if you ever have a male calico cat, that's a big deal. Female orange tabby is also cool, but it's not as cool. Love it. Your goob is a big deal. She is a big deal. Hardly she's a goob at, at birds all. birds right now, and I'm, I'm glad she's holding it together. <laughs> <laughs> Get a load of this. Um, okay. So uh, I think it was about a month ago. I This is like a Minneapolis specific thing, but... I uh, went to a um, this like community variety show at, at this place called Bryant Lake Bowl. Have you ever been there? Yeah, ben? yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Cool. I went there and the variety show was called Weird Stuff Only, <laughs> and it was basically uh, different artists getting up on stage and doing some sort of like artsy uh, presentation of this weird thing that they have made. And I was surprised that there is actually this whole community in Minneapolis that is like around puppetry. Uh, there were a lot of just like puppet shows at this thing. Okay. Um, and one of the really cool ones that I'm just like, why aren't these people working for, I don't know, uh, Disney or something? Because the storyboarding was literally amazing. Um, there was a puppet show called Hot Dog Hustle. <laughs> and it was uh, all about um, this alternate world where hot dogs are used as currency and just what our world would look like if that was the case Perfect. and it went to just absolutely wild wild heights um and i was on the edge of my seat and yeah this was <laughs> this was a fun little thing that i went to and i love hot dog hustle <laughs> i love it that's great get a load of this i learned that uh tomizawa from yakuza 8, or like a dragon infinite wealth excuse me um is based on like a real guy and or like his voice is provided by 
a guy who is his doppelganger. Like, they clearly designed him around this guy. Oh. Um, his name is uh, Satoru Iguchi, and he is the keyboardist and vocalist for the Japanese band King Nu, G-N-U, um, which is a band I'd heard of, but, like, I don't know. I, I first saw a tweet that was just like, yo, this guy is real life Tomizawa, and I was like, wow, he really does look like that. And then I Googled it, and I was like, oh, that's also literally his voice actor. <laughs> so um, I guess we'll never see him again after this game, which is really sad. But That's fun. Uh, hey, get a lot of this. Um we're very lucky where people send stuff uh, to MinMax all the time of like, hey, here's a game or here's just a random thing promoting this game. Can you please take pictures of it on your social media account? Just a lot of stuff that we typically auction off for the Give to the Max charity stream, you know? And so we got a book recently and it was like, oh, it's like the memoirs of somebody who worked on some video games that were largely unremarkable if I may be brutal, but I was like, you know what? There's, I am like, I have a lot of books that I need to get through that I've been meaning to read, but I was like, there's something about this type of thing. Like I kind of want to read, uh, an unremarkable man's memoirs. <laughs> and so I started wow. reading this book and I was charmed in such a big way. And it starts out by like having a bunch of stories from his childhood and how he once spent a lot of time with John Travolta's sister. <laughs> just like that level of like fun, weird, specific stuff. And then it kept going. And then he was talking about like, oh, you know, and then I was working at Konami. And here's actually, Konami had a song uh, that they sent to all the employees. And I was like, wait, I heard Kelsey talking about this. On the video game guy's house hour. a bunch of times. Yes. <laughs> and so then it's because I remember you talking about it on the Video Game History Hour Foundation podcast um or the video game history hour over there um and then i realized like oh this is the guy's house that kelsey went to this is that dude mark flitman i hadn't connected those dots and then i like go into the back of the book and in the special thanks for this book it's like special thanks kelsey lewin <laughs> this is so <laughs> wow. bizarre um so yes the the book is called it's not all fun and games um, and it is just this guy's full journey through the game industry. A lot of stuff focusing on like a claim, um, but it's fascinating because I mean he was working on NES games, early computer games, even before that, and that all the way through PS2 games. I think is maybe the most recent stuff that he worked on. But then he worked at Hasbro and stuff like that. And he just has a really fun, unique perspective on a bunch of licensed games for like Super Nintendo wrestling games and a bunch of Simpsons games in there as well. Um, and yeah, it, it's, it's the type of memoir, memoir that I would love to have more of in the video game industry, you know, like it's yeah. not going to be, Hey, here's how overwatch came together, which is a great book. But like, just the fact that this guy was no offense. He seems, he seems delightful, Kelsey, no offense to this man, but he seems like a bit of a ham and someone who has like just enough of that hammy ego to be like, yeah, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and write this book. Like that's what it takes to get these stories about, what a mess Midway was to work at in the early 2000s. Like, let's get some more of this real history out there. And it takes a ham like Mark Flipman, God bless him, to get this stuff out there. Yeah, 100%. And I mean, Mark started writing this book not to publish, but just to share uh what what dad's life was like with his daughters. Really? Um, so his yeah, his initial, like, he was basically just writing this all down because his daughters were kind of like, hey, you know, you you worked at cool companies. Like, what was that like? And he was like, you know, I should I should start documenting this. Um, and at a certain point, you know, you have all this and you realize, hey, this kind of looks like an actual book. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think it's fantastic. I um, I have told him this to his face a few times, but I'll, I'll say it again here. Exactly. Like, I think there needs to be more people who just kind of give us a real inside look at what, you know... There's no one else writing about what licensing was like at Konami, yes, you know, like yes. we get we get these very big like auteurs and uh, mm -hmm. broad overviews and stuff. But we don't get these um, like like sideways cuts into video game companies, this sort of like the slice out of this random area of this company and this company. And like, yep. um, yeah, some of the most interesting documents we were finding we were going through his stuff was literally just things like the licensing agreements it's like yeah what how did you license a marvel property in the 90s right you know what what was that process like we have no idea yeah unless yeah. you saved your stuff yep I, i'm totally with you you know we talked about it before when we talked about cliffy b's book as well where it's like my favorite stuff in that book was him talking about 
you know, Bosky Productions? Like what went wrong at that studio? Because like no one's writing books about this studio that eh, didn't really do anything too spectacular and then was shut down, you know? But like the fact that that's that whole chunk of that book, like, yes, this is, this is good video game history stuff that should be out there in a bigger way. And so him talking about, you know, developing virtual BART uh, on the Super Nintendo and how it originally was going to have 3D glasses that went along with it, or him talking about, uh, speaking of Xbox, about him like visiting the studio that Don Matrick worked at in the early 90s in Vancouver, and this was Don Matrick, uh, the head of Xbox during the Xbox One era and all that stuff. Um, but even in this, he talks about like, yeah, his office, he kind of had like this big elaborate fish tank that like separated him from the rest of the employees. And even in the early nineties, I thought that was a bit much. So I love just like this early glimpse of like Don <laughs> Matrick who completely derailed Xbox even back in the day. It's like, I don't know. He was that big fish tank guy. He wasn't cool. Um, but anyways, it's called, it's not all fun and games. And it's just a, it's a fun, fast read. Um, and I, there's a couple things, Kelsey, where I'm like, oh, I didn't know about this and I actually ordered it so we can maybe stream some games or maybe some hardware that he worked on if you know where that's going. I think it'll be a fun, weird surprise because there's weird stuff that I didn't know existed. Uh, I think that's it for this episode. Oh, I'm sorry, the community. Oh, forgive me, community. Um, Forest with two R's in the MinMax Discord where everybody shares get a load of this links and it's truly a fantastic news feed. Leo can account to that. Mm-hmm. Thank I you. read it. It's good. Um, anyways, uh, there is this uh, story from Kotaku, but it's citing IGN, and I think it's Rebecca Valentine's story over there. But the story got out there about uh, how a spiritual successor of SSX from the original mm -hmm. creators of the series was in development at Supernatural uh, Games and had a publishing deal with 2K, but 2K recently pulled out and the game got canceled, and so we're not going to get this spiritual successor to SSX, oh, which is sad. It feels very, we're very primed for that type of thing. But that is it for this episode of the MinMax Show. Uh, Elise, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. This was fun. Yeah. Um, do you want to give us your dream job one more time and how folks can reach out to you if they're looking for a certain <laughs> role? Sure. Uh, people can find me on Twitter at Elise Favis or on LinkedIn. Just again, my full name, Elise Favis. Um, and looking for any and all opportunities in journalism, communications, community. Uh, public relations, um, anything hopefully that's in the video game industry because Yeah, right on. You were kind of cutting out there towards the end, but yes, anything, and it needs to be a full-time job to keep you with the visa. Yeah, it needs to be a full-time permanent position. I can't do any contract work uh, while I'm on my visa. Gotcha. Turkey specific stuff. Uh, let's see, plugs for MinMax. Uh, if you're looking at the YouTube version of this episode, you can see if you join the Backstage Pass tier, you can literally be on the show. It's the easiest way to be on the MinMax show is we have the chat up throughout the entire thing so they can uh, help us uh, answer the questions, weigh in on uh, question of the week and all that stuff during community questions. There, so you can they were pretty out. split between bug person and bird person. Oh, really? I didn't get a decisive take. I kind of, I, to, to be honest, I was expecting a, a land slide for birds yeah but i was i i was humbled on that and i and that's the right thing to happen that's what can you someone mean. explain how he how garris is a bird person he has a beak it'd be like kissing a beak kind like of a yeah he looks like a bird to me and i'm not trying to out anybody on this podcast but kelsey how many times in your life would you say you've kissed a beak <laughs> literally Oh, dozens, hundreds. <laughs> hundreds. Okay, really? there we go. Yeah, my little guys. I kiss I kiss my little birds on the beak sometimes. That's good. That's Aww. good. Mostly, I guess mostly on the top of their head, not on the beak. Yeah, you're classy. I get it. Yeah. Um, mm. but I like his bugs every day, so. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. Come on. Let's see. Doesn't uh, count. Bonus pod, everybody. Our Patreon exclusive podcast. If you want to help support the show and more than double the amount of podcasts you get from MinMax each and every week, you can unlock that bonus podcast feed where bonus pod itself is the star of the show. Haley McLean's show. Uh, I guest hosted it this week because uh, Haley was busy. So Jacob and I uh, dove into the weeds on analytics for MinMax's content in 2023. If you want to know. Uh, the behind the scenes look at all things MinMax for Twitch and YouTube and the podcast stats and running through numbers and how much we made off Twitch, how much we made off YouTube, all that fun stuff. Uh, we dive into all that if you want to be a dork with us there. Also, I really get to geek, yeah, get to geek out in a big way over um, Frank Capra, like the old director from the 30s and 40s. Um, I really went on a tear over the holiday break. It was my main passion over the holiday break that I didn't have an outlet to talk about until bonus pod of talking about all of his movies and why they're so compelling and 
just, you will have more fun watching a Frank Capra movie from the 30s and 40s than any movie you could put on today. I promise. Like, especially if you got a partner and you just want to, like, crack wise about it, but also be wowed by it. They're genuinely funny. They hold up great. Big um, claim. What's, what's the best one? Ooh, it's... To start look, with. This is so... It's Wonderful Life, probably. <laughs> like, you know, if you haven't seen that movie, you should probably make some time for it. But uh, You Can't Take It With You uh, is also a great one. But we dive into all that stuff on Bonus Pod. Um, but uh, also we talk about having dinner with the Final Fantasy VII Rebirth director uh, at that press event and having over two hours of one-on-one -on -one time with Hamaguchi. We dive into all those fun details and that Bonus Pod, so you can check that out. Uh, Charles, what would you like to plug? Um, you can go read my Mar vs. Donkey Kong review. Uh, that's on GameFormer.com slash something something Mario vs. Donkey Kong review. Um, I don't know. That, that's probably what it is. I'm just guessing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I'm on Twitter, ChuckDuck365. You can see my stuff. I have a, a musical portion of the Game Informer show this week, so yeah. that'll be fun. Hell yeah. Um, also, yeah. hey, you edited uh, the... Highlights from the deepest dive on Final Fantasy VII Remake on Minmax's channel here. I did. That was, I really like, I haven't played that game. Or I played part of it, but I haven't played a lot of it. And it was very fun. It's fun hearing people have really strong opinions about stuff you don't really, you don't really have a horse in the race in. <laughs> so I was like, I was surprised by how amused I was of just like, they're getting so mad about this Roche guy. And I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know what his deal is, but I like that. Jeff's really fired up. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Sweet. Uh, all right, that's it for this episode of the MinMax Show. Thank you so much for watching and listening. Remember, you can join the Game Champion tier if you want and choose any game under the sun. We'll declare you a champion of it in the description for every MinMax video and podcast and also on this very podcast right here, right now. Uh, just like Maniac is officially the champion of Starfield. Great choice. Uh, the champion of Dead or Alive 6, I don't know if you've heard about this, that's Malcolm Holiday, of course. Jessica Starr is the champion of Wizard of War, W-O-R. So look alive, everybody. Uh, and the whole Hamdamley is the champion of Super Smash Brothers Melee, which is going to be a tough one to beat in that game championship poll coming up. But that's it for this episode. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll be back next week. Be good, have fun, let's go! Bye.